get started. I will begin by doing uh, the roll call. Madam Clerk, call the roll to ascertain the presence of a quorum. Thank you, Madam President. Councilor Arroyo. Present. Councilor Baker. Here. Yeah. Councilor Bach. Present. Councilor Braden. Present. Councilor Campbell. Present. Councilor Edwards. Present. Councilor Sabi George. Present. Council Flaherty? Here. Council Flynn? Here. Council Janey? Present. Council Mejia? Present. Council O'Malley? Present. And Council Wu? Present. Madam President, we have a complete quorum. Thank you so much, Madam Clerk. I've been informed by our clerk that we have a quorum. And at this time, I'm going to invite Councilor Bach uh, to take over and she will introduce our clergy for the day, for today. Councilor Bach. Thank you so much, Madam President. Um, I'm really uh, pleased to be joined today by the Reverend Paige Fisher. Um, she's a member of the clergy at Trinity Church in Copley Square, um, an Episcopal church, which has also been um, my church for my entire life. Um, and I'll uh, make the introduction a little bit personal, just to say that um, uh, the Reverend Fisher was, uh, you know, my youth minister and uh, priest growing up in the church. And actually, some folks have noticed I'm always wearing a cross around my neck, and this is the one she gave me when I turned 18 and was headed off to college. Um, and, uh, and one of the things I think about a lot is uh, I, I grew up in a church um, that uh, that has, um, you know, men and women serving as priests, and uh, and just that plain fact meant that when I was growing up, I thought about, you know, the religious life and clerical life as something that was an option for me and obviously didn't go that road, but it makes me think a lot about how just uh, just who is in the seats, you know, and the roles that we look up to um, when we're young shapes our sense of possibility. Um, and definitely uh, uh, the Reverend uh, Fisher, uh, who to me is Paige, um, really shaped uh, my spiritual life and an important part of my um, my growing. So uh, I'm, it's a it's a personal thing for me to have her here today, um, and I'm so glad that uh, she could join us. She's a she's a graduate of um, the University of the South and Episcopal Divinity School, and as I said, ordained in the Episcopal Church. So, Paige, thanks so much. Thank you, thank you so much, and thank you for inviting me. And um, I so appreciate that. I'm going to invite us to have just a few seconds just to center and take a few deep breaths, and then I'll begin. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for this new day and for the gift of your presence among us. We offer gratitude for this city of Boston we call our home and for this council that seeks to find the greatest common good for all with faithful dedication. In this time when anxieties and tensions are running high, illness and financial challenges abound, and deep inequalities and injustices have been brought to light, May this council and each of us always be guided by the spirit of community, by the spirit of justice, and by the spirit of love. In the discussions and decisions of this day, give us courage to speak the truth boldly and to speak it with compassion. Give us patience to listen openly without bias or judgment. Give us confidence to explore and create new ways forward and give us wisdom to discern what is just and what is right. We ask this all in your name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Reverend Fisher. That was wonderful, um, particularly moved by the spirit of community justice and love. And that's what we need to preside over this meeting and all of our meetings. So thank you so much. I hope you will join us as we pledge allegiance to the flag. Thank you. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. 
Thank you um, so much. Um, so now we will move on to our first order of business, which is the approval of the minutes. And if there are no corrections to be made, the minutes of the last meeting will stand as approved. Uh, I see a hand raised by Councillor Arroyo. Councillor Arroyo. Madam President, I'd like to move for uh, us to observe a moment of silence of eight minutes and 46 seconds to reflect on the people of color in our communities, the black lives in our communities and George Floyd. And I'd be asking for a second for that eight minutes and 46 seconds of silence. Is there a second? I second that. I hear a second. So I'm going to move that we go ahead and observe that moment of silence, building on the wonderful prayer that we just heard. Um, I will take responsibility, I guess, for setting a timer. A moment of silence, please.
Thank you for that, Councillor Arroyo and Councillor Braden. Um, now, if there are no corrections to be made to our minutes, the minutes from our last meeting will stand as approved. Seeing and hearing no objections, the minutes are approved. Now we will move on to uh, communications from His Honor the Mayor. Madam Clerk, if you could please read docket 0817. You're muted. Can, Madam, yes, Madam Clerk, we can't hear you. You're still, sorry. You're muted. It, it, the, they all, everyone was muted um, yes. and we were doing moments of silence. Thank sorry you. about that. That's all right, would you mind starting again? Yeah, of course. Docket 0817, message and order authorizes the City of Boston to accept and expand an amount of $23,348,669 in the form of a grant for the FY20 Emergency Solution Grant COVID-19 Supplemental. Awarded by the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development to be administered by the Department of Neighborhood Development, the grant will fund special activities to prevent to prevent, prepare for, and respond to the coronavirus pandemic among individuals and families who are homeless or receiving homeless assistance. This award is the second allocation of the program under the CARES Act. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Clerk. Docket 0817 will be referred to the Committee on Housing and Community Development. Uh, now we'll move on to reports of our public officers and others. Uh, Madam Clerk, could you please read docket 0818? Thank you. Docket 0818, the Constable Bond of Pitt, Matra Duncans, and Michael James and Vincent James have been duly approved by the Collective Treasurer, were received. Thank you. Docket 0818 will be referred to the Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice. Madam Clerk, yep. Don't We're going to take a couple together, though, if you don't mind. Dockets eight, uh, 0819 through 0821. Perfect. Thank you. Docket 0819, notice is received from the city clerk in accordance with Chapter 6 of the Ordinances of 1979 regarding action taken by the mayor on papers acted upon by the city council at its meeting of May 20th, 2020. Docket 0820, notice is received from the city clerk in accordance with Chapter 6 of the Ordinances of 1979 regarding action taken by the mayor on papers acted upon by the city council at its meeting of June 3rd, 2020. Docket number 0821, communication was received from the city clerk of the filing of the Boston Redevelopment Authority of the Fifth Amendment to the report and decision on the new Boston Food Market Chapter 121A project. Thank you so much, Madam Clerk. Dockets 0819 through 0821 will be placed on file. Uh, and now we'll go on to uh, reports of committees. Madam Clerk, we'll start with Docket 0729. Thank you, Madam President. Docket 0729, the Committee on Public Health, to which is referred on June 3rd, 2020. Docket 0729, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expand reimbursements up to the amount of $10 million from the Federal Emergency Management Agency and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts for expenses related to the COVID-19 pandemic, submits a report recommending the order ought to pass. Thank you, Madam Clerk. The chair recognizes Councilor Arroyo, chair on the Committee of Public Health. Councilor Arroyo, you have the floor. Thank you, Council President. Uh, one second, I want to get the report ready. Uh, so at the hearing, um, Boston Budget Director Justin Starrett testified in support of the docket on behalf of the administration. Mr. Starrett explained that on March 27th, FEMA declared a major disaster declaration for Massachusetts related to the COVID-19 pandemic, which triggered the availability of federal funding for local governments. He explained that FEMA coordinates with Boston through the Massachusetts Emergency, Emergency Management Agency, NEMA, to manage ongoing crises as well as facilitate applications for public assistance grants. Boston is partnering with NEMA and the statewide accounting team to submit reimbursement requests to, re requests to the PA program for COVID-19-related expenses. Uh, Mr. Starrett explained that the FEMA reimbursement application process, noting that current eligible reimbursements are restricted to Category B, emergency protective measures. 
Category B, eligible costs are limited to activities undertaken to eliminate or lessen an immediate threat to lives, public health, or safety. In this case, expenditures directly related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Mr. Starr provided an overview of the project that the city is seeking initial reimbursement for, which include costs related to the emergency shelter, including Boston Hope, personal protective equipment from public safety agencies, BPS, and city departments, disinfecting facilities like city halls, schools, and BPS sectors, and emergency operations, 301, and public communications. It was noted that the assistance that FEMA provides through PA programs is subject to a cost share. The federal government should get 75%, leaving the city of Boston responsible for 25%. Mr. Starr stated that they are awaiting final guidance, but the city anticipates that the CARES Act funding will be able to be used to cover the difference. Uh, as chair of the Committee on Public Health, I recommend moving the list of docket from committee to full council for discussion and formal action. And my recommendation is that this option pass. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you so much. Councilor Arroyo seeks acceptance of the committee report and passage of docket 0729. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, aye. aye. The ayes have it. Docket 0729 has been passed. We'll move on to docket 0683, Madam Clerk. Docket 0683, the Committee on Government Operations, to which was referred on May 6, 2020, docket number 0683, ordinance banning facial recognition technology in Boston, submits a report recommending the audit ordinance ought to pass in a new draft. Uh, thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councillor Edwards, chair of the Committee on Government Operations. Councillor Edwards, you have the floor. Thank you. Confirming my sound and confirming I'm not sideways. <laughs> we can hear you and you look great. <laughs> Technical issues, man. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> dear counselors, uh, docket 0, uh, 0683, an ordinance banning facial recognition technology was sponsored by counselors Wu and Arroyo and referred to the committee on May 6th. The committee held a hearing on June, 20, or June 9th of 2020 and there was a public comment taking and a working session on June 19th. <clears throat> the docket would ban the use of face surveillance by the city of Boston or by any official in the city of Boston. The proposal would prohibit entering into agreements to obtain face surveillance with third parties. The docket defines the terms surveillance, face surveillance and face surveillance system. The docket lists exemptions to the prohibition of face surveillance use for the following purposes. Evidence related to the investigation of a specific crime, obtaining or possessing an electronic device for evidentiary purposes for user authentication, using face recognition on an electronic device for the sole purpose of user authentication, using communication software provided such, um, does, such use does not include the affirmative use of any face surveillance, using automated redaction software provided such software does not have the cap capability of performing face surveillance, and complying with the National Child Search Assistance Act so docket 0683 also contains enforcement provisions should a violation occur. At the hearing, the committee heard testimony from Boston Police Commissioner William Gross, members of the ACLU, the Student Immigrant Movement, Boston Teachers Union, and many other organizations and individuals. The committee learned and discussed that the Boston Police Department does not, does not use facial recognition technology because it is not reliable and does not meet the standards of the Boston Police Department. The committee also discussed and heard testimony about the inaccuracies of the facial recognition. At the working session on June 19th, we reviewed language changes offered by Councilor Arroyo and the Electronic Frontier Foundation. The proposed changes include the following. <clears throat> when Councilor Arroyo changing the title of the ordinance to provide clarity and adding a section of the adding the section of the city code where the ordinance would be placed in also adding language concerning information requested by the police department adding fee excuse me that's it for councilor arroyo the proposed changes included sorry about that councilor arroyo the proposed uh, changes and included in the ordinance provide from from electronic frontier foundation provide the following they add a section to the city code where the ordinance would be placed in, adding language concerning information requested by the police department, adding fee shifting language, and adding language about private sector use when involving city permits. Representatives from the Boston Police Department de participated in the working session, as did many of our colleagues on the city council. The representatives from the police department discussed the brief cam sof software and the upgrade of such software. The police department explained that the software license allows the department to shut off the facial recognition aspects and use the software and upgrade for 
uh, upgrade for object recognition and video summary, which they absolutely wanted and emphasized that those are things they wanted to make sure that they had. The police department explained that the language is vague in section B2, and the police department stated that um, in, a, in a subsequent letter that they sent to my the committee on Monday, that they um, that it's important that we also include an exigent circumstances component, and also that we um, change the word from may to shall, uh, from shall to may in the fee shifting component. Um, but at no point did they ever debate that they are using the that they that they are intending to use facial recognition or that they use it right now. Um, it is my recommendation that after all of the following um, changes and with the amended version, including them, that we um, that we use this information or that we we take the amended version and the committee report. And I ask that my colleagues adopt both and vote favorably or to ban facial recognition. Or that the amended the amended version ought to pass. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that. I've got myself on mute. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, wonderful. Um, thank you so much for that thorough report, um, Chairwoman Edwards. Wanted to just offer a brief opportunity for the original sponsors if they wanted to weigh in. Obviously, there's opportunity if other uh, colleagues have comments as well, but I want to start with the leads. Um, Councilor Wu or Councilor Royo, did you want to offer anything or should we just go right to discussion? Uh, Madam no, President, I would like to just weigh in and comment three things. Yep. So we're going to do this with a show of blue hands. We're going to call upon folks a show of blue hands, and I'm going to start with the original sponsors. So by a show of hands, wonderful. I'm going to begin with you, Councilor Wu. Councilor Wu, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Just wanted to offer some, some deep gratitude to the committee chair for her diligent and, and very quick work on this. Um, as mentioned, there were many, many conversations, and this was meant to be done on a timeline to uh, fit with timelines for the police department's need to upgrade their software and make sure that everybody was on the same page. Boston should not be using racially discriminatory technology and, and technology that threatens our basic rights. We have seen now, you know, just this morning um, in the national news, the, the first case of a, a man in Michigan arrested, detained, forced to, to spend, you know, pay, uh, to be out on bond because he was misidentified uh, uh, with facial recognition technology. So this is a present issue. It is, it is uh, one that is real. And I thank the Boston Police and Commissioner Gross for being involved in this and for um, affirming that the Boston Police have not been using this and agree with us that there are many serious concerns. Uh, finally, I just want to thank the co-sponsor, um, Council Ricardo Arroyo, as well as our whole coalition, ACLU of Massachusetts, Student Immigrant Movement, um, Unafraid Educators of the Boston Teachers Union. Um, we're working to end systemic racism, so ending the surveillance, uh, over-surveillance of communities of color needs to be a part of that. And we are just truly standing with the values that public safety and public health must be grounded in trust. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councilor Wu. The chair recognizes Councilor Arroyo. Councilor Arroyo, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. I would just like to echo the gratitude to uh, our chair, Councilor Edwards, uh, for working, uh, doing a great job on the working session and, and shepherding this through. I also just want to thank the advocates who've said so much and done so much to make sure that this was prepared, the ACLU, SIM, uh, Unafraid Educators, and everybody else who's emailed or advocated for something that I do believe in, and I think PPD reaffirmed uh, and I'm, I'm happy and proud that they did, uh, that is a technology that they would not use. That is a technology that uh, puts Bostonians, frankly, at risk for misidentification, uh, for systemic racism, for a number of different purposes that, frankly, at this time, uh, we don't need. And, and frankly, I, I applaud them for standing up uh, and supporting this for uh, the work that it does to, uh, to protect civil liberties. So thank you uh, to BPD. Thank you to all the advocates. And thank you again to uh, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you so much, uh, Councilor Royo. The chair recognizes Councilor Baker. Councilor Baker, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just have a question through you to either the, the chair of the government ops or the makers. Will this affect our ability for investigations, like say the marathon bombing? That Those images captured were not considered facial surveillance. I, am I correct in my thinking there? 
I'm going to turn that over to the chair of the committee, Councillor Edwards. Um, correct, Councillor Baker. That, that was actually through video surveillance. Um, and that we're not stopping video surveillance, just the technology that can zero in on a face and supposedly miss what we're finding, misidentifying individuals. Thank Council you, Madam. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. The chair recognizes Councillor Bach. Councillor Bach, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I just briefly wanted to again commend the makers, thank the chair. Um, I certainly uh, learned a lot from the working session and the prior hearing. Um, thank all the folks who testified. Um, and just echo one more time the thing that I think I've said at each occasion on this, which is that um, I think we get we get focused on the sort of the technology and the nuance of how of how it works and doesn't work, and the fact that it has this um, racial discriminatory nature is a huge issue with it. But I think. We have to go beyond that to say, let's not live in a society where we are constantly surveying each other's faces and we just decide that it's a normal thing for us to be able to track where everybody's going all the time. I think that um, we really have a tendency in this country to go, to let our technology go ahead of our common sense about like how we wanna live together. Um, and it's just, it's, that's why to me, this is, this is such a critical intervention for the council to be making in this moment. So thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, the chair recognizes Council Mejia. Council Mejia, you have the floor. Uh, yes. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I just want to thank the makers and just lend my support um, in voting yes on behalf of this very important um, issue. And I wanted to just say that to me, what I have learned through this process is that when you bring everybody to the table um, and listen and learn, you can get to a common ground. And I think um, supporting this um, ordinance and just the process that we've gone about doing it is a really good example of what it looks like when we bring everyone to the table. So thank you to the makers, thank you to the chair for all your hard work and thank you to the advocates for bringing it this far. Happy to support it. Thank you, Councilor Mejia. The chair recognizes Councilor Braden. Councilor Braden, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I'd also like to echo Councilor Box. Uh, uh, words of caution. I feel that, um, you know, although this um, there's good reason to ban this technology right now because it's unreliable. And uh, but going forward, we have to also consider whether just some because something's possible is it the right thing to do. So even if there are significant improvements in this technology, I, I agree with uh, Councillor Bach that surveilling our population at large and uh, doing facial uh, identification. Uh, is not necessarily the way we want to go in free society. Thank you. Thank you so much. If there's no other discussion, we will move forward with the vote on this docket. Uh, seeing no other discussion, um, the chair of the Committee of GovOps seeks uh, acceptance of the committee report for docket, and I want to make sure I have the docket right, Zero for docket 0683. Thank you so much. Um, she seeks acceptance of the committee report in a new draft. I want to make sure I get that language. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. The ayes. Vote. The vote is doubted. M Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll? Councillor Arroyo. Yes. Councillor Arroyo, yes. Councillor Baker. Yes. Councillor Baker, yes. Councillor Bork. Yes. Councillor Bork, yes. Councillor Braden. Yes. Councillor Braden, yes. Councillor Campbell. Yes. Councillor Campbell, yes. Councillor Edwards. Yes. Councillor Edwards, yes. Councillor Asabi George. Yes. Councillor Asabi George, yes. Councillor Flaherty. Yes. Councillor Flaherty, yes. Councillor Flynn. Yes. Council Flynn, yes. Council Janey. Yes. Council Janey, yes. Council Mejia. Yes. Council Mejia, yes. Council O'Malley. Yes. Council O'Malley, yes. And Council Wu. Yes. Council Wu, yes. Madam President, Docket 0683 received a unanimous vote. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Clerk. Uh, the committee report has been accepted in new draft. Uh, and docket 0683 has been passed. Thank you. Uh, we will now uh, move on.
0732. Thank you. Doc, thank you. Doc, docket 0732, the Committee on Ways and Means to which was referred on June 30th, 2020, docket 0732. Message in order authorizing the City of Boston to increase the elderly property tax exemption pursuant to Mass General Laws, Chapter 59, Section 5, Clause 41C, from $750 to $1,000, effective for the fiscal year 2021. So Mr. Report recommending the order ought to pass. Would you like me to also read 0733, Madam President? Uh, yes, why don't we take those together? Thank you so much. Wonderful. Docket 0733, the Committee on Ways and Means, which was referred on June 3rd, 2020, docket number 0733. Message and order authorizing the city of Boston to lower the interest rate that accrues on property taxes deferred for eligible seniors from 4% to 1% effective fiscal year 2021. Pursuant to Mass General Laws, Chapter 59, Section 5, Clause 41A, submits a report recommending the order ought to pass. Thank you so much, Madam Clerk. The chair recognizes uh, Councillor Bach, Councillor Bach, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Um, the do the two dockets, uh, 0732 and 0733, are um, two small amendments to existing um, property tax uh, um, exemption or deferral programs that we have at the city. I think it's important for folks to know that um, these are very narrowly tailored programs where almost, well, basically all of the stipulations of them are set by the state. Our local option as a city is just to take them on. Um, so we don't have a lot of capacity to tailor them, um, unfortunately, which is one of the things that we discussed in the hearing. Um, but the, there are a couple of um, minor modifications to them that the city does have the ability to, um, to make. And in light of the ongoing um, economic situation and uh, the fact that these are, these are both targeted at helping in particular um, lower income elderly uh, homeowners and residents with um, with you know challenges handling their taxes that we could make it slightly easier for them. So there are two proposals here from the mayor's administration. Um, one is to increase um, the exemption, this is for seniors, um, from $750 to the statutory maximum of 1,000. Um, the eligibility criteria, I wanna stress again, for this program are very limited. They're constituents with demonstrable need um, they have to be at least 65 years of age, a Boston resident who lives at the property as a primary residence. They have to have lived in Massachusetts for 10 years, own the, own the property at least five years, and their maximum income has to be under $25,000 for single taxpayers and $38,000 for married um, with really limited assets. So to be honest, I mean, that's, you know, I think that, I think we can all agree that I, I think, you know, um, there are a bunch of seniors we would all probably like to help who don't fall under those strict um, remits, but certainly seniors who are on that low of a fixed income and are owning a property um, are folks who we who we want to help um, you know make it through this crisis. And we did hear from Commissioner Arnello um, that there are uh, about um, 590 participants in that program, um, which results in a total exemption of. $583,000 in tax. So it's it's not an enormous liability to the city, um, but it does really help those folks. So that's the first proposal is to increase that exemption from $750 to $1,000, um, which again is the maximum that we're allowed to go up to. Uh, second one, docket 0733 is related to um, deferring to property taxes that are deferred. So this is in the case of, a, um, a again, a senior citizen, um, slightly higher maximum income. So this time it's uh, 60,000 for a single person or 90,000 for married. Again, someone who's occupied a property for five years falls behind on their taxes. And basically we, the city makes a deal with, with them that they can defer um, the ongoing taxes and sort of credit it against the equity in the property up to up to 50% of the equity. So it's a way of, you know, if you're trying to live in your house, house rich and, and income poor, um, it's, a, it's a way of handling that situation. Um, but you, typically the, um, the folks who end up in this program are folks who have had trouble paying their taxes. And so there is, there's some uh, deferred tax that they're, like, that they're trying to pay back. And, uh, and, and there's also um, the, as they defer those taxes against the equity, there's a question of like how much they're going to, how much interest we're gonna charge them against the equity in their home. And when the city first implemented this program, it, it implemented a 4% interest rate, which was competitive with the interest rates at the time. 
but as I think people largely know from their personal life, um, interest rates have really plummeted. Uh, and so the proposal here before us is um, to reduce the interest rate that gets charged to the participants in this to 1%, um, which is more consistent with sort of the market and also um, more consistent with what our neighboring cities are doing. So Brookline has uses the same system um, and one other town, whose name I'm forgetting, uh, also has it set at 1%. So this kind of puts us at parity. Um, to be honest, this program affects a very small number of people. We heard from the commissioner that it's 31 participants right now. Um, and I think we actually had some good conversation about, you know, how could we publicize it more broadly? And then also, I think, you know, how do we, how do we tar figure out um, as counselors, you know, who the, who the people who really need this kind of assistance who are not targeted by these programs are and petition the state um, around, you know, narrowly tailored opportunities there, keeping in mind that, you know, we're about to talk about budget and obviously property tax revenue is the main source of everything that we want to pay for in the city. Um, so that's a bit of an explanation on those two. Um, and uh, my recommendation as chair is that both dockets um, ought to pass. And I should say that they also, um, in order to go into effect for the coming fiscal year, would need to be passed at the uh, prior to the coming fiscal year. So thank you, Madam President. Thank you so much, Councilor Block. We're gonna take the vote separately on these dockets. You've heard about both in, in the chairwoman's uh, presentation in her report. Um, so Councilor Block seeks acceptance of the committee report and passage of docket 0732. All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay. The ayes have it in docket 0732 has been passed. Now we'll move on to docket 0733. Um, Councilor Box seeks acceptance of the committee report and passage of docket 0733. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, nay. The ayes have it and docket 0733 uh, has been passed. Now, before we go on to the next big section in our agenda, I'd like for us to get some of our a regular work done, so just to reorder, to do our, our motions, orders, and resolutions. Um, and I'll warn us, once we do this, we'll probably need just a short little recess to take a break, maybe get a bite to eat, and then we're gonna come back and get into uh, matters recently, which is our budget, okay? So Madam Clerk, I'd like to start by skipping to docket. I'm sorry, there's a little feedback there, okay. Uh, Madam Clerk, let's skip down to docket 0823 under motions, orders, and resolutions. Thank you. And we'll come back to the other section in the agenda. Great. Docket 0823, Councilors Wu and Edwards offer the following ordinance to establish unarmed community safety crisis response system for nonviolent emergency calls. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councillor Wu. Councillor Wu, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Um, could I make a motion to suspend the rules and add Council Mejia as an original co-sponsor? Seeing and hearing no objections, Council Mejia has been added as a third co-sponsor. Thank you. And then um, apologies, but one more motion to substitute language as there is an um, important omission that we wanted to correct. Seeing and hearing no problem with that, we will substitute. What's the, what's the, what's the, I want to make sure that correct? people have this language. Madam President, what's the correction? Yes. Madam um, President, what's, what's the correction? Right. She's going to indicate that, and we're going to make sure yeah. that we get that in front of everyone. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. So, on, so when we speak, uh, Councilor Wu, you will indicate that, but also important for that new language, it needs to be emailed out to everyone so that they have it before them. So if someone on central staff has that new language, yep, to I email out. It's, it's hit my inbox already, so hopefully it will be getting to everyone soon. So I will encourage my colleagues to look at the new language, and Councilor Wu, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Madam President. Um, so just to highlight the, the difference, um, the concept of, of this ordinance and the, the good that it hopes to deliver um, directly connects to a situation that had happened in Boston a few years ago. And um, we, as the co-sponsors, have been in touch with the family um, of Terrence Coleman and um, had not wanted to invoke his name prior to um, having that conversation. But uh, Mrs. Coleman, in fact, 
affirmatively wished that her son should be part of this uh, legislative push and asked us to add his name to the ordinance. So there's just, um, in the very first whereas clause, we've added in um, his name and wanted to make sure that that was reflected in the updated language. So um, just to describe the, the goal of this, as we were having a conversation about how to structure our public safety and public health infrastructure in Boston, we need to move towards the responsiveness to voices who've been crying out and, and wanting to, to both deliver services and do it in an efficient and effective way. There are many other cities in the country who have taken on a similar system of establishing an unarmed, trained crisis response alternative to 911 calls that would be diverted away from law enforcement uh, for nonviolent emergency response calls. This means that someone from a background with mental health expertise or uh, substance use counseling, social work, um, community outreach would be deployed instead. And the, uh, the experience from the other cities who have implemented this have shown that it not only delivers better outcomes for residents in terms of safety and health, but it also has saved money as well because they are delivering the most efficient resource to meet the need. So this is one example of a way that we could affirmatively move towards that vision of restructuring and transforming our public safety and public health systems to better deliver safety and health for all residents. So um, thank you so much to my co-sponsors, Councilor Edwards and Councilor Mejia. Um, thank you to the family and um, Mrs. Hope Coleman as well for those conversations. We're looking forward to engaging everyone um, in this discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councillor Wu. The chair recognizes Councillor Edwards. Councillor Edwards, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Madam President. I want to thank the co-sponsor, uh, my co-sponsors, Councillor Wu and Councillor Mejia. This ordinance is about structural change and how we keep people safe and also can increase trust in our government. National polling shows that across party lines, people want options when it comes to public safety. This is not a replace the police conversation. This is how do we increase safety in the most uh, community-based and centered way. There are national examples all over that we can look to for, for ways in which we can answer the national call for reform, but do it through Boston's way. We can look to New Orleans, we can look to Miami, we can look to Eugene, or Oregon, Oregon, excuse me, we can look at Dallas, Texas. But at the end of the day, Boston will answer this call for reform on our own terms with our officers, with our folks in the community, with our pastors, and making sure that we provide the best options possible for Bostonians. And who would they, they would be responding to? What examples are we talking about that are non-emergency and non-violent? Well, simple stuff. We're talking about crowds of young people making too much noise in a park or maybe setting off firecrackers. We're talking about seniors with de dementia sometimes who have wandered off that need to have a family response. We're talking about folks uh, in my own family who are paranoid schizophrenics who need help and need, uh, and I may need to call somebody, but I don't wanna call 911. I wanna call somebody who has the training and mental health ability to deal with my family member. We're talking about homeless, homeless individuals, um, a couple of uh, one actually who actually sleeps on or near my car, perfectly fine man. But at the end of the day, I don't need to call 911. What I need to do and I want is a government response to his needs. We're talking about folks who are also uh, dealing with substance abuse or other homeless folks who are sleeping in the doorways in some of the shops in the North End or on the street or on the playgrounds. Too many times people knee jerk to call 911 and that is not necessarily an emergency but we do need to respond to that. We need a public response and family members overwhelmingly, again, across all family uh, political parties want this option. We are creating essentially a fourth level of first responders that deal with nonviolent and non-emergency concerns. Uh, we will actually be setting the table. I have been lucky enough and I'm, I'm happy to talk with the commissioner about this. I'll be talking with EMS and publicly we'll have a conversation where the entire table is coming together to come up with a healing process and a way to keep our city more safe. We're, we're talking about actually the fact that police are asked to do too much. They're asked to be mental health counselors, youth workers, uh, marriage counselors. They're asked to deal with all sorts of different things. And in many cases, they don't have the training for it. And in other cases, they shouldn't be doing it. Let's be honest. We're talking about wonderful things that they are doing, BEST and HUB. These are examples of us, um, of us already taking and looking at policing differently. 
But what this calls for is an actual structural infrastructure that builds on that, not a sort of, and when appropriate, and in certain communities, depending on how well the communities are organized. No, this is about the city of Boston creating a whole department, either under or separate from the police that deal with public safety. I'm excited for it. I think actually a lot of people are overwhelmingly excited to have this conversation. Um, I think that at the end of the day, we will become stronger, we will heal more, and we're gonna hear about some painful incidences, but also on both sides, where there are EMS workers that were attacked, but also where our community members who needed mental health services were met with police um, services. So at the end of the day, this is a good thing, this is a conversation, and when, and I say when, this, or, this uh, ordinance passed, it would be within 90 days that we would be getting this, um, this plan, or at least a uh, presented plan for the city of Boston. I'm excited. Thank you so much, <laughs> Councilor Edwards. The chair recognizes Councilor Mejia. Councilor Mejia, you have the floor. Yes, uh, thank you, Madam President, and thank you to my sisters in service, Councilors Wu and Edwards, for bringing us into this space and working on this ordinance. Our office has been very outspoken about this issue of fireworks in our neighborhoods and the trauma that it causes. And um, when we held our community, co community conversation around this topic, we received a lot of responses from people who did not want to involve the police in this matter. We know that this is a crucial time for us to reimagine how we honor the service part of the protect and serve. This is our chance to better serve members of our community, and it is crucial that we take the time to get it right. I look forward to having mental health ex experts at the table to talk about ways that we can not only uplift the work that is already being done, but that we talk about the ways that we can make improvements to our mental health infrastructure in ways that holds us accountable to the people we are here to serve. I am grateful to be able to work alongside Councilors Wu and Edwards in pushing this work forward and recognize that at the end of the day, this is, isn't about replacing the police, but it's really about making sure that we're addressing the issues that are happening in our community in ways that is culturally competent and reflective of what that issue is and that need. And so for me, um, I think that this is an opportunity for us not to just be louder and bolder and more aggressive about the changes, but it's really an opportunity to change the way we do business here in the city of Boston and grounding it on the social, emotional, and mental well-being of those that we serve. So I'm here for all of it and thank my colleagues um, for including me in this conversation. Thank you so much, uh, Councilor Mejia. The chair recognizes Councilor Flaherty. Councilor Flaherty, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, please add my name. I appreciate our colleague, uh, Councilor Edwards, uh, how she framed it. Uh, obviously, look forward to uh, the hearing on it. I think it'd be welcomed uh, by uh, you know, our uh, public safety personnel. You know, we're blessed. It's an interesting um, dynamic between theory and practice. We're blessed in Boston that when someone calls 911 in a relatively short period of time, they've got blue lights, they've got red lights, and they've got orange lights at their doorstep, uh, probably unlike other, um, you know, other communities in other cities uh, our size and greater. Um, I know from firsthand when I worked in the DA's office, um, our mental health professionals they used to call 911 to do their um, well-being checks. Uh, they didn't come in from Newton in, in Chestnut Hill or Brookline to do them. They called Boston police to do them for them. And then they took the police reports and then they put them in and worked them up as part of uh, their document. So it'll be interesting to see how we can make this work. Um, know that uh, in 2019, we had 683 and 346,000 911 calls. Let me say that again, 683,346 911 calls from everything from A to Z. Uh, we've seen it with the fireworks. Uh, we want a community response, but no one's pulling that car over and, and, and getting that big uh, you know, batch of fireworks out of the trunk. Um, no one's confronting the person that's shooting off the bottle rocket. So we've had a couple successes over the last couple of weeks. It's because the community has partnered with our local police department. In my own neighborhood, Council Flynn and I working with area C6 and also working with the state police uh, led to a significant size bus where all those fireworks came off the street. So again, it's, it's, it's great to theorize about that potential. There's gonna have to be a lot of buy-in, not just from our, our law enforcement and our public safety officials, but from other, those other sectors that we're gonna ask uh, to intervene and to be that community response, to, to respond to that 911 call in a domestic situation, responding to that 911 in a mental health situation, or just to respond to 
to, to try to stop fireworks. Um, those types of situations go from bad to worse real fast, uh, particularly uh, if someone gets violent. So again, I think this would be welcome by our police, fire, and EMS. So we, we've got 911 calls reported that firefighters have gone and been asked to, to turn someone's heat up or to put their air conditioner in. So it gets a little crazy out there. So I just want people to have a full perspective as to the realm of, of, of possibilities with respect to 911 calls. Um, and again, there's a big difference between theory and practice. And are those 911 calls going to stop? Not based on 683,000. Just this in the five months alone in 2020, there's been 310,960 911 calls. And just in the first five months, there's been 8,533 calls for fireworks. Think about that. Um, so folks are, are just uh, grappling with how to, re how to deal with this. And chances are the community response isn't going to solve the problem. We're going to need our partners and our police officers, our firefighters and our EMS. They're our partners. They're going to be part of the solution here. And so I, I think it would be welcome by them. I'd like to learn and hear more about the ordinance. I'd love to get their participation. Uh, we often say, one of our colleagues often says, you know, um, you know, uh, they talk about when we're talking about something, uh, I think it's the phrase is uh, something about us without us is not for us, but we need our public safety folks at the table with us. We need to find out what their lived experiences in terms of what those 911 calls are like and how they respond to them and how things go from bad to worse real quick and how they're needed uh, in our communities. And so that said, uh, again, please add my name and look forward to an expedited hearing. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you so much, Councilor Flaherty. The chair recognizes Councilor Bach. Councilor Bach, you have the floor. Thank you so much, um, Madam President. I, I want to commend the makers and ask, please add my name. I think this is a, I think it's a really exciting idea and I think about it, I think it has really concrete applications um, in my district. I, um, you know, our, my district, District 8, um, which includes the Boston Common, um, includes, you know, the, up by the Boston Public Library Central Branch, like it really is the outdoor living space for a lot of folks in our homeless, unhoused community. Um, and, and I think all the time about how in this country we criminalize just not having a home, even though we also don't want to give them to people. Like it's just a, it's just a, a particular cruelty of um, the way that we've structured our society. Uh, and I think that um, all the time folks who, you know, some folks who don't want to see people in that circumstance and some folks who, you know, as Councillor Edwards was alluding to, are trying to provide people with help. Um, call 911. Um, and I really, again and again, see the way, and I hear from our first responders how their capacity to respond in a, um, in a useful way, like, is just limited. It's not the set of, it's not a set of tools um, that they have. And, and I think a lot about what we could learn, not only from other cities, but from sort of micro examples in our own city of how people are handling this. So I guess it's, um, uh, it's funny, this is not a theme I anticipated for the day, but uh, I have this other necklace that is from, um, there's uh, this group called, I'll hold it up. It's called, there's this group called Common Cathedral, which has been meeting, having an uh, outdoor service on the Boston Common for 40, 50 years since the 70s. Um, and and it's, really a, it's really a church community of unhoused folks. Um, but during the, during the week, they, they run an arts collaborative on Wednesdays um, at the Emanuel Church. They've got a, uh, Boston warm and Boston cool in the in the winter and summer that are um, providing support in in COVID they've adapted so they opened for another day of the week um, and and the community started actually providing um, chargers because there's been so few places for people who are unhoused to charge their devices which we all know are like a lifeline so you have that in addition to to food and water and support and help you know um, filling out paperwork and and it's a it's a community in which everybody's helping each other. Um, and it's one that I've been really moved to learn more about um, in, in the period that I've been doing this job. Um, and so I, th I think that that is a, a hugely more effective um, service for uh, my unhoused constituents um, than 911 calls generally are. And I just think that's another, that's another model that we have the potential to really learn from as, as we think think about what something like this could could look like. So I'm just very grateful to the makers. Um, and to me, I think this is, as Councillor Edwards said, you know, this is a moment that's about structural change and structural change is about creating institutions and practices um, and and community assets that can that can actually do the work. So just really grateful for this. Thanks. Thank you so much, Councillor Bach. The chair recognizes Councillor Braden. Councillor Braden, you have the floor. 
Thank you, Madam President. I, I want to commend the makers for this very important uh, 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 hearing order um, and this important uh, innov innovative approach. Uh, I, when I spoke to the captain at District 14, um, I asked him you know, to get to know what the call-outs were in our district. And he reported to me, to my surprise, that the, the, the majority of the call-outs were mental health issues. Um, and uh, he, he admitted that, you know, uh, that the, the, our uh, police officers are not, they do the best they can, but they're not always uh, best equipped to deal with uh, mental health crises. Uh, I had a case recently of an elder who was uh, an elder who was an immigrant who um, didn't speak English, uh, and she's got dementia and she wanders and uh, goes into folks' yards and picks the vegetables and makes herself at home. And it's very distressing for the for the residents because they, they don't they uh, not that they don't want her there, but they want her to be safe. And uh, uh, it's it's again the repeated calls to 911 haven't led to a satisfactory resolution. So uh, to the point of just uh, language skills and cultural competence and uh, a more appropriate response to folks in a mental health situation or a homelessness situation is something that uh, is critical to addressing the structural change that we need to see. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Councillor Braden. The chair recognizes Councillor O'Malley. Councillor O'Malley, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Madam President. Uh, I, I uh, wanted to just speak uh, in support of this initiative. Uh, it absolutely recognizes a broader view of what public safety should uh, could mean and should mean. I think most police officers know and would certainly agree that there are certain calls, particularly around mental health, substance abuse, homelessness, or other public health initiatives that can be best handled by a clinician uh, or other public health professional. We've seen some great outcomes from the co-responsive model of uh, the Boston uh, Emergency Services team or the BEST team that redirects non-violent 911 calls to mental health clinicians. Um, most of the common calls that they respond to are related to suicidal ideation, child mental health crisis, substance abuse, or family dispute. Um, we should absolutely expand these types of response teams, uh, which can better serve our vulnerable populations, as well as come up with creative and community-centered solutions. Uh, so I look forward to the hearing. I think I agree, as, as Councillor Edwards and others have said, this isn't about replacing the police, but this is really looking at a new approach uh, and really recognizing uh, how public health really uh, drives so much uh, of public safety. So I uh, look forward to the hearing, look forward to convening all the relevant stakeholders, having this conversation, figuring this out. Please add my name. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councillor Sabi George. Uh, thank you, Madam President, and uh, thank you to the makers for this order before us today, please add my name. I think that so much of the comments that have already been shared from the makers to, and to colleagues has been this conversation around better access and improved access to mental health services. And we know that throughout the um, city, and I hope that the makers, when the hearing is scheduled, will include um, those of the best team that are doing this work today, especially in partnership with Boston Police right now. And the work of that outreach team needs to be um, considered and discussed at the table because they do a lot of this work in a, uh, in a uh, novel way um, as of the last few years. There's also an incredible amount of work done around outreach, especially to our homeless residents through the Pine Street Inn. So I hope that the Pine Street Inn outreach team is also included in this work and certainly the efforts of the Boston Public Health Commission. We also need to realize that uh, the Boston Public Library has taken a really interesting approach to serving our residents who um, utilize library services, obviously not now during the pandemic, and we see what a risk many of our homeless residents are in now because our libraries have been closed during the day for the last few months. So there are so many of these things happening in these mini silos and in a response to the greater need uh, across all of our neighborhoods in our city. So, so many of these pieces that are, I think are brought up in, and discussed in this ordinance are in existence and it's about creating that infrastructure. It's about coordinating those services. Um, so I'm really excited about this. Uh, and I hope again that BPD, especially their outreach team is at the table. 
um, EMS and their Squad 80 that does a lot of outreach to our residents that are in need. And, and we know that EMS is responding to a lot of our nonviolent mental health calls. Uh, uh, so the pieces are there, the pieces exist. Now bringing them together in a coordinated way, I think is some of the effort um, that's desired through this ordinance. Uh, is really exciting to me. And, and so to, to make sure that we are keeping that mental health piece central to the conversation is really important. But look forward to this um, this conversation and to the work that remains ahead and I'm done. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councilor Royo. Councilor Royo, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. And I'd just like to, uh, from the bottom of my heart, thank the makers. Uh, I deeply appreciate this. Uh, I think this is something that can work. Uh, if you go to Eugene, Eugene Orman, uh, you can see a working example of this. Uh, I think it takes things off of uh, the plates of police officers who are overburdened and often called to do too much. Uh, I think those numbers for 911 uh, really don't reflect what those calls are for and what those calls can be addressed to do. I, I do think a more troubling number for me, especially, is 70%. That's the number of stops for uh, black men and women in Boston when the population is 23%. And I think anything that we do that helps our communities, especially communities of color, find a way to receive the services that they need without burning police with extra responses as a home run, uh, I think this is something that will help us control their overtime. It will help us control what their, their risk is day to day. I think there's just so many positives here. Uh, for our communities that I, I endorse this wholeheartedly and I can't wait to see this go from theory to action. So thank you again to the makers. Uh, thank you to everybody who's uh, worked on the ground for a very long time for this kind of a response, for this kind of option. Uh, I know fireworks were raised and I'll leave it on this. I've received, I've been inundated with calls of folks who wish that there was another option other than police for addressing fireworks. This would create another option other than police for addressing fireworks. Um, and I think that's something that's important, the kinds of ways in which this will impact our day-to-day -day lives and the way in which it may keep people healthy, keep people safe, uh, all across the board uh, is just a home run. So thank you again to the makers, thank you to the advocates. Want to add your name? Absolutely. And, and, and I'm gonna go through a, another round of who wants to add <laughs> names because not everyone has indicated. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Um, the chair recognizes at this time, Councilor Campbell. Councilor Campbell, you have the floor. Um, thank you, Madam President. I, of course, uh, echo my colleagues in thanking the makers. Um, please do add my name and, um, you know, lifting up this model of, of, of a crisis response which centers um, a public health approach rather than a response by law enforcement and law enforcement officers um, I has seen incredible success in other cities, and I know that's mentioned in the, in the ordinance. Um, I absolutely believe that developing a system to divert nonviolent 911 calls from the police department to the appropriate non-law non enforcement agencies will not only improve public health and public safety, but will also save us money, uh, which is a major uh, conversation today. Um, I also know it will save us uh, costs associated not only with policing, but also with incarceration, which is critically important as well. Um, of course, this reform has to be coupled with many others, and I look forward to uh, the department adopting not only this, but so many others that have been suggested by colleagues on this, on this body. Um, and Councillor Sabi George, I know, has been doing incredible work with respect to the BEST team. Um, they are doing great work on the ground, so I look forward to the conversation on how they get incorporated um, in this new model, whether it is via the police department, outside of the police department, because they do a lot of work and it has been a conversation for years on how we expand our budget to allow for more clinicians that serve on the bus best team to respond to critical calls that are nonviolent in nature. So please add my name. Thank you, Madam President, and thank you to the makers. Thank you so much for that. Um, and let me just add my two cents of, I am really impressed and grateful to the makers for this. I think it's a game changer. I agree that our police officers are overburdened just the way our teachers are. We're asking people to be the end all be all for everyone. I think this is a really important conversation that can really uh, reshape and get us to the Boston that we hope to see. So thank you to the makers. At this time, I'm going to look for those who would like to add their name by a show of physical hands in the screen. Thank you so much. Madam Clerk, if you could please add to this ordinance 
uh, Councilor Braden, Councilor Flynn, Councilor Sabi George, Councilor O'Malley, Councilor Bach, Councilor Royo, Councilor Flaherty, Councilor Campbell, Councilor Baker, and please also add uh, the chair. Dr. Uh, zero, are we on? Zero two three, okay. Zero eight two three. Docket 0823 is being referred to the Committee on Government Operations. Now we will move on to Docket 0824, Madam Clerk. Docket 0824, Councilors Braden and Wu offered the following order for hearing regarding the child care crisis in Boston. Thank you. Uh, the Chair recognizes Councilor Braden. Councilor Braden, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Um, Thank you uh, also to my colleague, Councillor uh, Wu, for uh, co-sponsoring this. Hey, excuse me a moment. I need light, please. Somebody put the lights <laughs> um, Co-sponsoring this hearing order. Um, colleagues, uh, there are many moving parts to the, uh, this, our city at the moment in, with regard to the COVID crisis and also our ability to have our workers uh, get back to work. And one critical piece of the equation is, the, uh, is access to affordable uh, daycare for our children. Uh, in my district and across the city, we hear reports of family daycare providers deciding to discontinue providing a service. And also we hear of uh, the larger, uh, more corporate uh, childcare providers uh, also deciding to close their daycare centers. Uh, case in point, we have a daycare center in, in, in Oak Square in Brighton, uh, that, uh, the Little Sprouts Daycare, and it is, it is, not, re it is not opening, it is closing. Uh, so we have a crisis on our hands in which uh, families' access to um, affordable daycare is under threat. And uh, I really feel that uh, we need to have a hearing to review the situation, assess the situation on the ground, and see if we can come up with some workable uh, solutions to help alleviate this problem. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councillor Braden. The chair recognizes Councillor Wu. Councillor Wu, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President, and thank you to the lead sponsor uh, for her leadership and for inviting me to partner on this. Um, as as uh, may be known, this is an issue that is near and dear to my heart and has been um, very difficult for so many families during the pandemic and especially now. Uh, we are in a little bit of a, a limbo um, as our economy moves towards reopening, but childcare centers have not received the support necessary to open safely for the protection of an already underpaid, largely women of color workforce um, and for the children and the, the, um, the group sizes needing to be restricted and therefore additional demands on space and facilities. This issue in general is one that I'm proud that the council has championed for several years now. Um, so shout out to my colleagues who had partnered in an earlier iteration uh, when the then four women serving on the Boston City Council took up this challenge to spend a year examining different issues on, uh, related to the childcare crisis in Boston. Um, unfortunately, we still need to see a lot of that work realized, and it is more urgent than ever, given the pandemic and the economic um, impacts that have happened on top of the public health impacts. So thank you again to the lead sponsor. I look forward to digging in and, and coming up with solutions based on community experiences. Thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> uh, but anyone ma ma Madam President. Yes, Councillor. If I may, if I may, may I suspend the rules and add Councillor Andrea Campbell as a co-sponsor? Co Rule 12. Yes, seeing and hearing no objections, Councillor Campbell is added as a third original co-sponsor. Thank you for that, Councillor Braden. Councillor Campbell, you have the floor. Um, thank you, Madam President, and thank you, Councillor Braden and uh, Councillor Wu for your leadership on this, along with, of course, other councillors as well who've been working on, on this critical issue for a really long time. Um, I also want to give a shout out to Tanya Del Rio in the Office of Women's Advancement, who has been doing incredible work on this issue. Um, we have long known and recognized that this is not merely an issue that involves uh, families. It's not just a women's issue. It is an economic issue, and COVID-19 has clearly pinpointed that 
Um, and so while we wait for a federal bailout and we hope that uh, this industry and the, the magnitude of the crisis currently, that the federal government will step up. I know many in the, our Massachusetts delegation are pushing for incredible resources to come from the federal government. Um, I look forward to working with my colleagues to push for the state, of course, as well, to show up, um, but also the city to push a little bit more. I know we did the survey in the entrepreneurial fund. Um, but right now, you know, the, the access and quality issue in terms of early uh, care uh, and education has been a major issue for years. And now, um, in addition to that, providers, and most of whom are women and people of color, including those from the immigrant community who run these businesses, um, not only need immediate capital and support to survive and be able to, to go back online coming out of COVID-19, um, but they also need to be at the table informing the very decisions affecting their industry. And so I look forward to not only this conversation and hearing, but also pulling in those providers who often, I think, feel left out of the conversation, who want to be at the table informing our policy discussions on this critical issue. Um, and I look forward to supporting this industry and these providers in any way I can and ensuring they are successful. I'll add, many are in my district, which is largely, of course, Dorchester and Mattapan. Um, they fill the gap in terms of those who are unable to access Boston Public Schools, early uh, K or pre-K programming. Um, and that's in an incredible gap to fill. And so it's important uh, during this particular time that we be extremely intentional in supporting these uh, providers and these families. Thank you again to the makers and thank you, Madam President. Thank you so much, Councillor Campbell. At this time, uh, if folks want to add their name, a show of physical hands would be great. Madam Clerk, if you could add Councillor Flynn, Councillor Sabi George, Councillor Edwards, Councillor O'Malley, Councillor Bach, Councillor Arroyo, Councillor Flaherty, Councillor Mejia, please also add the chair. Uh, docket 0824 will be referred to the Committee on Strong Women, Families, and Communities. I've been informed by the clerk that docket 0825 has been uh, withdrawn, so we will now, uh, I'll turn it over to uh, Vice Chair O'Malley at this time. Vice Chair O'Malley. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, Madam Clerk, could you please read docket 0826 into the record? Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Docket 0826, Councillors Janie and Campbell offer the following ordinance, establish, establishing Juneteenth as a holiday in the city of Boston. Thank you, Madam Clerk. The chair now recognizes the council president uh, and district councilor from District 7. Councillor Janie, you have the floor. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this, this opportunity to follow up on important work that was introduced at last week's meeting. Uh, before moving forward, I'd like to ask for suspension of Rule 12 uh, to add Mejia as an original uh, co-sponsor to this ordinance. Seeing no objection, Rule 12 is suspended and Councillor Julia Mejia is added as an original co-sponsor. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, great. <clears throat> Just pulling up. I got too many machines over here, too many de devices, <laughs> too many piles of paper. I'm pulling up some talking points here. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm really proud to continue the work that we've already started on this council, uh, particularly in this moment, um, fighting for all in our community to be protected uh, and to be elevated and supported and, and uh, celebrated. Um, so I'm really proud to join in partnership with Councillors Campbell and Councillors Mejia uh, in honor of Juneteenth to put forth uh, an ordinance where we are calling for a holiday. Um, this is a celebration of Black lives. It's a cause for African Americans and their families to come together and to celebrate um, not just what it means to, to come together as a community. I wanna come back to our, our invocation, that spirit of community, of justice and of love that uh, Reverend Fisher talked about. It is that for us, but it's also about our liberation. <clears throat> so we know the history uh, with the Emancipation Proclamation and all the time it took for folks in parts of our country to get word of, of the emancipation. Um, and June 19th is the recognition of that day. It's interesting to me that this conversation falls right in the middle of the actual observance for Juneteenth, which was June 19th. 
And this country's official recognition and holiday for independence, which is July 4th. Um, and so we're having this conversation and trying, in my mind, to reconcile the two, because we understand that what we celebrate in July um, still feels to many of us like we've got a lot of work to do to be truly free. And so to have um, conversation and action, which would elevate the true liberation of folks, and we still have more work to do to get that, to that true liberation, but this holiday, and, and recognizing a Juneteenth in the city of Boston and in the Commonwealth uh, is an important place to start. We know uh, that we can't go back. We know that we have to keep moving forward. There's been good movement here since we had the conversation last week with the resolution. We know there's movement at the state. Um, people signed on, the council signed on to a letter that the mayor sent to the state in support of this holiday. This is our chance to, once again, actualize something um, and go beyond talk. So if we do care about this agenda, if we want to talk about what it means to be free and what it means um, to have independence and to be a free nation where all of our residents, where all of our citizens can enjoy that freedom and the full rights of citizenship, then I hope folks will join in supporting this ordinance calling for just that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam President. The chair now recognizes the district councilor from Mattapan, Councilor Campbell, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Councilor O'Malley, and of course, thank you to Councilor uh, Janey and Councilor Mejia for the partnership um, and the continuation of the discussion from last week's council meeting where we recognized Juneteenth. Um, I have been incredibly pleased to see um, and joyful to see all of the celebrations, not just here in Boston and in Massachusetts, but across the country to celebrate Juneteenth. Um, and I'm, of course, signed on to the mayor's letter, which is in support of state legislation to make Juneteenth a statewide holiday. And I do think that's incredible. I think it's important. Uh, but this is an opportunity for us to do what's in our power. And so this ordinance looks at what we can do locally in the city of Boston to make this a holiday. Um, and I think demonstrates our values. And I think isn't unreasonable when you think about what we're having, what discussions we're having right now in this country with respect to police brutality and inequities. Um, and so I look forward to the conversation and in, uh, inviting folks to participate. I'll add, while this is a holiday that we reflect uh, and reckon with our history of slavery in this country, which is a painful one and a traumatic one, it's also um, an opportunity where residents also celebrate at the same time. Um, this is American history. I think Councilor Edwards said that best at our last meeting. This is American history. And I've been extremely surprised, actually, since having the conversation at last week's council meeting, how many folks did not know what Juneteenth, Juneteenth stood for, what it meant, um, and uh, how it connected to our American history. So I do think this is an opportune time not only to set aside this day for city employees uh, to participate in activities uh, with respect to this uh, important historic event, but also an opportunity for our residents, including our white residents uh, and residents of color who also did not know um, what Juneteenth stood for, to participate in conversations related to that history, to celebrate, and then to, of course, join in action where we work together to dismantle systems that continue to perpetuate inequities for communities of color. So I look forward to that. Um, and lastly, I'll say this came up at the last council meeting, Roxbury Homecoming has been the event uh, to celebrate Juneteenth. Um, and I know for Councilor Janey and I, it is extremely personal being from Roxbury. Um, and so uh, how might we uh, use our platforms, this city, to really um, add additional resources and opportunities for everyone across the city to participate in that homecoming? Because it should mean something to all of us. Uh, thank you, Mad uh, Madam Chair, Mr. Chair. And thank you again to Madam President uh, and Council Mejia. Thank you, Councilor Campbell. Uh, the chair now recognizes the at-large council from Dorchester. Councilor Mejia, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Vice, Mr. Vice President, and thank you to Councilors Campbell and Janey, um, especially for including me in, in this. Um, as I mentioned in my speech last week, Juneteenth is a time to celebrate, but it's also a call to action. We are closer than ever to achieving big changes in our system and holding the people in power accountable to those that they serve. Black history is American history and declaring Juneteenth and 
and a city holiday is an important step in valuing and validating the voices and experiences of Black people in the city of Boston. It is just that, a step. And there is so much more work to be done, and I hope that by next Juneteenth, we will be in a better place than we are now. I hope that we will have the time to reflect on how far we've come and how much further we have to go. You know, um, I always talk about being an Afro-Latina and claiming my Black roots. And I think that oftentimes that makes um, some people uncomfortable, particularly Latinos. Um, and so for me, um, standing in, in solidarity and fighting for this to be a holiday is also a call to action and an opportunity to hold um, the Latinx community to recognizing the power of our Blackness and not denying that. So I stand here with my sisters to say we're going to fight for this to become a city holiday um, and look forward to amplifying the voices of the people to ensure that it happens. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mejia. The chair now recognizes the uh, at-large council from Dorchester, Councillor Anissa Saibi george Councillor Saibi george you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice President, and thank you to the makers for this ordinance today. I would say that it's a week late, if not um, a generation late. I'm really excited um, to sign on to this. Please um, count my support. And for me, especially as a former high school teacher and uh, recognizing that this is a June holiday, that this be viewed as not just an opportunity for the barbecues and the get-togethers, which are so important to, our, to, to celebrating our roots and our histories, but that it's also an opportunity to continue learning um, and to continue our um, not just awareness, but acknowledgement of our history, of our American history. And uh, making this a holiday, I think, makes that more possible and certainly is a directive for all of us to continue doing this work and to continue not just, again, with the awareness and the acknowledgement, but the work that needs to go into uh, the teaching and the learning uh, around our American history. Uh, so thank you uh, to the makers for this, and thank you, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Councilor Asabi George. Uh, Madam Clerk, please add Councilor Anissa Asabi George as a co-sponsor. Uh, the Chair now recognizes the at-large Councilor from Rosendale. Councilor Wu, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Just wanted to say thank you so much to our sponsors for your leadership, and it's an honor to serve alongside you. I'm actually really, really excited that we see the step up um, sort of feeling from last week and in, in first celebrating the holiday and, and the formal resolution and now really making it actionable for every single year moving forward. So I'm grateful. Please add my, my name. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam Clerk. Please add Councillor Wu as a co-sponsor. The chair now recognizes the district councillor from Beacon Hill. Councillor Bach, you have the floor. Thanks so much, uh, Councillor O'Malley. I think I, I just want to add my name and say um, I, a dear friend of mine and someone I, and I think like half the city looks up to a great deal is Jamada Smith, um, who organizes incredible um, occasions for Juneteenth every year. Uh, and I just think, I was thinking a lot last, last week about how meaningful it was to have our fair housing conversation on Juneteenth, but also the sense of, we shouldn't even be doing this this day because we sh it should be a proper, full recognized holiday. So I just really want to thank the council president um, and all the makers for their leadership on this and at my name. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bach. Madam Clerk, please add Councillor Kenzie Bach as a co-sponsor. The chair now recognizes the district council from Alston Brighton. Councillor Braden, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, please add my name. I'm, I'm so pleased and delighted to add my name to this and to support uh, celebrating Juneteenth as a, as a holiday in Boston. It is, it is past time and uh, it is an amazing uh, piece of our history and it needs to be recognized and celebrated uh, to, to in, in, in every way we can to lift up the story and to celebrate uh, this momentous uh, event that happened on Juneteenth. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Braden. Madam Clerk, please add Councilor Braden as a co-sponsor. The chair now recognizes the district city councilor from South Boston, Councilor Flynn, you have the floor. Unmute. Councilor Flynn, you have to unmute yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Um, please add my name, Mr. Vice President, and I'm proud to join my colleagues um, 
had the opportunity to sign on to the, the letter from last week from, from Mayor Walsh. Um, but I also wanted to uh, recognize the tremendous contributions, but also sacrifices that African-American community has made to our country, especially serving, especially serving in the U.S. military. Um, it, it often goes um, unnoticed at times, or unrecognized at times, um, but the contributions of and sacrifices of African Americans fighting for our country um, in, in wars and getting killed and coming back here after war um, and not treated well and um, having a difficult time accessing services and, and care, um, they put their life on, on the line for our country um, during many, many wars, including World War II, Korea, Vietnam. Um, so I just wanted to um, highlight that. And, and my friend that many people also know is Willis Saunders, the Tuskegee, Tuskegee Airmen, um, an all-black regiment that, that fought in, in World War II. So I just, I'm just proud of the uh, to join colleagues. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, uh, Councillor Flynn. Madam Clerk, please add Councillor Flynn as a co-sponsor. The chair now recognizes the at-large councillor from South Boston. Councillor Flaherty, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, please add my name. Uh, never missed one, as I mentioned uh, last week, uh, as referenced by uh, several colleagues. It's a, a chance uh, you know, for us to celebrate. It's a chance to, to, to reflect and to recognize uh, the great contributions uh, to our city and to our country, and also an opportunity for us to, to recommit to do better and to work closely together and, uh, and so I'm proud to serve as a co-sponsor and look forward to this uh, becoming a reality. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilor Flaherty. Madam Clerk, please add Councilor Michael Flaherty as a co-sponsor. Uh, obviously, I will take uh, Chair's program right now and uh, enthusiastically uh, endorse and, and add my name to this uh, ordinance as well. Long overdue. Really grateful to my colleagues uh, for their leadership. Look forward to celebrating this next year. Um, would any other councillors wish to add their name? Madam Clerk, please add the District Councillor from Dorchester, Councillor Baker. Please add the District Councillor from East Boston, Councillor Edwards. Please add the District Councillor from Hyde Park, Councillor Arroyo. I believe that is everybody. Uh, so uh, thank you. Docket 0826 will be referred to the Committee on Government Operations. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you so much, Councilor O'Malley, and thank you all for your support on that important ordinance. Um, now we'll move on uh, to docket 0827. Madam Clerk, could you please read that? Madam Clerk, you're on mute. No, we can't hear you yet. Can you hear me now? We can hear you, yes. Yeah. Thank so, you. Someone's muting, I think, at different times. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Docket 0827, Councilors Flaherty and Flynn offer the following resolution in support of House Bill 4767, Restaurant Relief Bill. Thank you so much, Madam Clerk. The Chair recognizes Councilor Flaherty. Council Flaherty. Madam President, uh, I'd like to suspend uh, Rule 12 with no objection and add Councillor uh, Matt O'Malley as an original co-sponsor. Seeing and hearing no objections, Council O'Malley is added as an original co-sponsor. Thank you so much. Council Flaherty, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. COVID-19 obviously is having an enormous and sustained impact on the restaurant industry, forcing many uh, to remain closed. Uh, uh, or switch to takeout only uh, and or now reconsidering whether or not it's making sense for them to, to remain open uh, given the regulations. So uh, we're now only recently providing limited uh, outdoor and starting to do indoor seating. And as folks recall a few weeks back, Council Flynn, Councilor O'Malley and I, along with others, held a hearing to discuss the impact of uh, the delivery commission fees on restaurants and discuss the possibility of placing a cap on the fees during the pandemic. During that hearing, we learned a great deal about the business models of third-party delivery services and how uh, deeply our restaurants are struggling with these fees. Uh, since our hearing, action has been taken at the state level in the form of House Bill 4767, uh, titled the Restaurant Relief Act. That would, among other things, provide a temporary cap uh, to the third-party delivery fees that would be that are urgently needed, uh, you know, for our restaurants, uh, particularly. Uh, 
uh, in order to keep our vibrant local main streets uh, up and running. And also there are some of our largest employers uh, throughout the city. The restaurant industry uh, has been a tremendous uh, asset uh, to, to all of our neighborhoods and also to the downtown. So I'd like uh, our body to express and urge, uh, to express support and urge passage uh, through the Senate so that we can provide our restaurants with the support they need to stay in business, to remain open, to remain competitive, and to continue to provide uh, this delivery service to get meals to people uh, that need them in the neighborhoods. And with that, uh, defer to uh, my co-sponsors for their word, and at the appropriate time, uh, urge for um, suspension and adoption. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councilor Flynn. Councilor Flynn, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Council President Cheney. Thank you, Councilor Flaherty. Thank you, Councilor O'Malley. I'm glad to work with both of you and my colleagues on this issue. Um, this is an issue we've worked on. We, we had a hearing, as Councilor Flaherty mentioned, last month to discuss a possible commission fee cap for third-party delivery companies. So I'm glad to know there is legislation up at the State House that would implement this fee. Um, delivery companies are charging 25, 30% commission on deliveries. That's outrageous. And many restaurants would pay hundreds of thousands of dollars every year on commissions. Now that most uh, sales for restaurants are still food deliveries, restaurants are paying a lot more commission to these companies, unfortunately. It's a huge burden. Um, when I think of a restaurant, I think of the workers, I think of the dishwasher or the bartender or the waitress that are that need that money to pay their bills. They need the money to pay the electric bill or, or to get some food or get some milk or bread for their kids or medicine for their for their mother. So it's 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 critical that um, we stand with the restaurants because they've been there for us. They're an integral part of the neighborhood as well. So I hope we're able to pass this resolution. Again, thank you, Councilor Flaherty. Thank you, Councilor O'Malley, and to my colleagues as well. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you so much, Councilor Flynn. The chair recognizes Councilor O'Malley. Councilor O'Malley, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, obviously, uh, enormously grateful to my colleagues, uh, Councilors Flaherty and Flynn, for our partnership with this. Um, I will be brief as we have uh, a lot more issues to address in today's meeting, but suffice it to say, H, uh, House Bill 4767 is a very important one. It's one of the reasons why we are moving for the suspension of the rules and adoption of this resolution today. Um, certain actions have to be taken at the state level as it relates to reining in these exorbitant costs, which are having an absolutely detrimental effect on our small businesses, on our restaurants, restaurants that are already reeling from uh, the effects of COVID-19. Obviously, we are seeing restaurants open up uh, in a limited capacity, and that will likely be the way things are for quite a while. Uh, additionally, you're going to have more and more people take advantage of food delivery, which helps keep these restaurants afloat and keeps jobs in our community. So we need to be able to cap those fees to both allow for uh, uh, protecting jobs, protecting small businesses, and quite frankly, protecting consumers as well. Um, I really wanted to uh, also thank all of my colleagues, particularly Council Mejia, who chaired the hearing that we held on this very issue several weeks ago. And one thing that came up through our research is many of these third party uh, delivery uh, fees. And to be fair, that is what we are talking about. We're not talking about the in-house restaurant that employs staff who would do delivery. These are these uh, three or four national companies that account for about 99% of all third party deliveries. Um, many of these uh, have restaurants on their site wherein the restaurant would have no idea that they are listed. So they are taking advantage of some of our small businesses. And uh, I am particularly concerned uh, with, you know, particularly some of our smaller mom and pop business, which, which may be, you know, two or three people running that may not have the, uh, may not even know that they're being featured. Uh, and this happened uh, at, a, at a restaurant that's very near and dear to my and many of you are hard or a family member works where they received a number of calls last week or with, a, with over the last couple of weeks looking for an item that hasn't been on their menu for months. And what happened was there was an old menu on one of these sites and it um, and there was they were charging more for it. So additionally, these third party vendors in some cases are making a profit off the hard work of these businesses. 
That's something that we need to address separately, but this is a crucial first step. Please join me uh, in suspending the rules and voting for and adopting this resolution in support of H4767. Thank you to my colleagues and thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Not seeing any further discussion, happy to entertain physical hands for sign on. Uh, Madam Clerk, if you could please add uh, Councilor Braden, Councilor Arroyo, Councilor Wu, Councilor Sabi George, Councilor Bach, Councilor Mejia, Councilor Edwards, Councilor Campbell. Um, Councilor Baker, did you want to speak to this? I see your blue hand up. Or did you just want to add your name? You want to speak? So please add Councilor Baker. He did. Yes, just add my name. Sorry. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And let me just say, I really appreciate this resolution and look forward to supporting it. Uh, supporting restaurants in my district has been, has taken up a lot of my energy and want to thank uh, those in the administration who have been helpful and supportive to the restaurants in my district. So thank you for bringing this forward. Our Councilors Flaherty Flynn and O'Malley. Um, Councilors Flaherty Flynn and O'Malley seek suspension of the rules and adoption of docket eight of 0827. All those in favor, Say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Aye. The ayes have it, and docket 0827 has been. What time is it? <laughs> Oops. Excuse me. Councilor Mejia, are you okay? I, I, um. Okay, let's just mute. That's okay. If you're not trying to say anything, you can just put yourself on mute. Okay, so at this time, we have been on for almost two hours. Docket okay. oh, 08. Oh, I'm sorry. Docket 0828. Motion yes. Yes. has been adopted. No, that was that was 0827. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I don't have my my agenda here. Thank you for that. Oh, you're We're welcome. Not, just you're yet. Welcome. I appreciate that. We've got another docket. It's on the <laughs> other page. It's on a separate page here. Thank you, Madam Clerk. You're Could welcome. you please read docket 0828? So we're not done. Sure. Docket 0828, Councilors Campbell and Mejia offer the following order for hearing to review all grants, city funds, and city programs for violence prevention and intervention pur purposes. Thank you so much. And again, my apologies to Councilors Campbell and Mejia for the oversight. Um, the chair recognizes Councilor Campbell at this time. Oh, no worries. Thank you, uh, Madam President. Um, thank you, Madam Clerk. And of course, thank you, Council Mejia, for the partnership on this uh, critical issue. And, you know, this is a hearing order that I'm actually refiling. Uh, it's a hearing that I held last year in Mattapan, actually, at the Mattapan Library. Um, and it was beyond well attended. You know, we, we couldn't uh, fit everyone in the room because folks deeply care about the issue of public safety, but also violence prevention and intervention um, and all the monies that go to programs uh, that are community based that do that work incredibly well. So people showed up. Um, we're continuing that conversation. The hearing was designed to get at a few different questions, which is how much money does the city of Boston receive for violence prevention and intervention programming? Uh, we receive money from the state, the federal government, as well as from our local budget. How much um, of the monies that we receive and that exist and are available to us, who receives those uh, monies? What organizations, what individuals, what is the process by which they are granted those funds? In addition, what metrics are in place to determine if these organizations that receive our dollars are effective in violence prevention and intervention? What metrics do we use to hold them accountable? Um, in addition to that, the conversation was also designed to say, where are the gaps? Um, so if there is programming available for the age range that tends to be, say, up through 18, but not older adults, how do we fill in the gaps in terms of programming? There were a lot of questions. I actually sent a list of questions to every department that participated prior to the hearing. And I will tell you, I left uh, really disappointed at the end of the hearing with the lack of information that, that was received. Um, and folks followed up because they wanted to know more with respect to uh, those questions, and some of which, most of which actually remain unanswered. And so we are having this hearing again. I think it is quite timely. Um, look forward to continuing the conversation. 
um, and of course, encouraged by the participation of more residents with respect to this critical conversation. Anti-violence work, violence prevention work, violence intervention work is critical. Uh, as a district council that just had a homicide in my district on Monday, this work uh, is um, beyond necessary, and if we don't get it right, we will continue to lose residents to violence, and that's just unacceptable. So look forward to the conversation. Thank you again, Council Mejia, for the partnership, and thank you, Madam President. Uh, the chair recognizes Council Mejia. Council Mejia, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President, and thank you to Councillor Campbell for her relentless and unwavering um, advocacy on all issues that deal with public safety. Really do so um, appreciate you. Um, I've been working with young people for my entire career. Um, and actually, I started off my career during uh, the time when violence was all in the heights, um, during what they call the Boston quote unquote miracle. And that was 20 something plus years ago. And here we are still having the same conversation and fighting to ensure that our streets are safe. And every day we're dodging bullets in our neighborhood. And we can't continue to do things the same and expect different results. The time is now for us to be louder and bolder about what these changes are gonna look like and holding ourselves accountable as to whether or not we're funding um, organizations in the ways that we should be and whether or not these uh, our efforts are actually giving us a return on our investment. And I think it's an opportunity for us to do a deeper dive in that um, conversation and, and uh, as, uh, Campbell, excuse me, Councillor Campbell mentioned um, during the hearing last week, I raised a lot of these questions about how and who gets the, to, gets the funding and whether or not we're holding ourselves accountable to that. So anyways, um, I would like to see this, uh, when I was running uh, during our uh, campaign, we ran on two major components of our policy platform. One was around youth engagement and uh, government accountability. And I see this hearing as the intersection of these two values. Since the outbreak of COVID-19, we have held uh, weekly conversations with young people centered around mental health. The biggest indicator of success as leaders in our time is the kind of young people we raise to be the leaders in their time, which is why I am so fired up for this conversation. We spent a lot of money on youth prevention programs, and we need to be carefully looked um, them over to make sure that we are doing things um, as much as we can um, with the resources that we have. This conversation needs to be solution-oriented and youth-led to ensure that we are putting the ones who are closest to the pain, closest to that power. Thank you again, Councilor Campbell, for your leadership on these issues. I'm excited to get to work because for me, nothing about us without us is for us. And I'm looking to uh, create a seat at the table for the young people to lead this conversation forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councilor Mejia. Uh, seeing no other discussion, if folks would like to add their name, this is the time. Madam Clerk, if you could please add Councilor Braden, Councilor Flynn, Councilor Arroyo, Councilor O'Malley, Councilor Edwards, Councilor Sabi George, Councilor Bach, Councilor Wu, please, uh, Councilor Flaherty, please also add the chair. I'm, I'm also grateful to the makers and reminded of the work that Councilor Campbell, Councilor O'Malley and I did in previous years and how this particular issue bubbled up, like how we're spending this money, who's getting the grants, how do we evaluate it? So thank you for carrying that forward. Um, docket 0828 will be, oh, please also add the chair if I didn't say that. Docket 0828 will be referred to the post audit committee. Thank you so much, Madam Clerk. Now at this time, I was thinking because we had We've gone two hours now that we might be ready for a little break, but I want to test the mood of the room. If people are ready to plow through, then we can keep going. But if folks like me need a little break or bite or something, let me know. This is not an official vote. I can just do it, but I'm interested in uh, just to show physical hands for folks who want to keep going. Folks, show physical hands for people who want to break. Okay, there's a few more hands. Again, it's not an official vote because I can just decide, but there's enough of us who need at least a bite or something. But 
we're just, this is a recess. I'm really asking if folks can come back two to three minutes so, um, that, we, so that we can get going. This is, this is with respect to the last docket. Okay, let me do, okay, before we go to the break it, we'll, we'll get to that. So we're gonna take just a couple of minutes, just quickly, whatever that bite is, if you gotta refill your water cup, if you have to take care of something else, quickly do it and come right back. So this is not a real break. You're gonna come right back. Before we do that, um, well, uh, while we do that, because I know people have some background things coming, we'll just mute all of the mics. Um, I will, when we come back, I want to take a quick little who's on the call because we don't want to start our budget conversation without all counselors present. This is not the formal uh, roll call in terms of attendance. We don't need to take attendance again, but I want to make sure everyone is back in the Zoom. So don't leave the Zoom, come right back to your seat, two minutes. Is that okay with folks? Mm -hmm. Great. And Councillor Campbell's okay. So we'll, um, I think, take care of that maybe during the break or something. All right, so we're just gonna take a quick two minute break. It's uh, 156 now. So no, we're gonna start this conversation at 2 p.m. All right, people, we're good with that? Great. Good. Yeah, I'm Thank good. You. Thank you so much. And if we could go on mute, just so that we're not cooking up the background noise for the recording, that would be great. How are we doing on attendees? Is everyone back in? My computer is locked on some other screen so I can't see the gallery view. Thank you, that's better. <laughs> um, let me see, where's my list? Okay, I see Arroyo, I see Baker, I see Bach, I see Braden. Is that Braden's background? I can't, I don't know if that's Braden or not. Uh, Campbell, I see Campbell, I see Edwards. I see, where are you, Asabi George? I see Flaherty, okay, I see Asabi okay. George. I see you, I see Flaherty, I see Flynn, Janie Mah Mahia, I see you, Baker, I see Mahia, I see O'Malley, I see Wu, wonderful. So with all of that being said, I think we're ready to resume. Everyone has their water, everything that they need. Uh, we will uh, move on to matters uh, recently heard for possible action. And this is the moment where we take our votes on the budget. But at this time, before we move forward, I wanna call upon the chair of the Committee of Ways and Means. She's gonna obviously give a committee report where she talks about the process uh, and how that's been done. But we also have to get all of the dockets before us because one of the things that I would like to do is make sure that all the dockets are on the table. That way, when we get to the point in the agenda when people are making their speeches, they can make one speech about all of the dockets. Okay, so at this time, I'm gonna call upon uh, Councilor Bach who will go next. Councilor Bach. A Chairwoman Bach, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Um, at this time, I would like to request that we take docket 0593 to 0596 from the green sheets out of order. And I would like to request consent of the body to speak on the green sheets and matters recently heard at this time altogether. Um, docket 0593 to 0596 are on page two of the green sheets under assigned for further action. And uh, detailed information on these dockets begins on page 20 of the green sheets. So, and with our process for green sheet, you will be getting uh, an email and we will turn to the clerk so the clerk can read them into the record. So Madam Clerk, as well as uh, checking your email, everything will be properly before the body. Madam Clerk, you're still muted. Yeah. That's Thank you, I'm sorry. 
Thank so, you. Madam, you're welcome. Madam President, um, I will read from, um, if it is your pleasure, 059C through 0596 off of pages 20 and 21 of pages 23, and then of matters recently heard from docket 0796 through 0800. Would you like Thank me you. to read all of that? Yes, and all of that will bring all dockets related to the budget before yes. us. Yes. Thank you. Please read all of those dockets. And for the green sheet items, you will have the email, counselors. Thank you, Madam. Thank you. Thank you. On page 20 of 23, in the Committee on Ways and Means, docket 0593, sponsored by the mayor, Message and order approving an appropriation of $328,895,000 to the acquisition of interest in land for the acquisition of assets or the landscaping, alteration, remediation, rehabilitation, improvement of public land, construction, reconstruction, rehabilitation, improvement, alterations, remodeling, enlargement, demolition, removal of extraordinary repairs, public buildings, facilities, assets, work, and infrastructure for the cost of feasibility studies or engineering or architectural services for plans and specifications for the development, design, purchase, and installation of computer hardware or software and computer assisted integrated financial management and accounting systems and any and all costs incidental or related to the above described projects for the purpose of various city departments included Boston Centers for Youth and Families Department of Innovation and Technology Environment Fire Neighborhood Development, Office of Arts and Culture, Parks and Recreation, Police, Property Management, Public Works, Transportation, Boston Public Library, and Boston Health Commission. This was referred to committee on April 8th, 2020. There was a hearing on April 13th, 2020, um, and it remained in committee um, and received its first reading on June 3rd, 2020, and was signed for further action. In the Committee on Ways and Means on page 20 of 23, document number 0594, sponsored by the Mayor, message and order appro <clears throat> approving an appropriation of $73,990,000 for the acquisition of interest in land or the acquisition of assets of the landscaping, alteration, remediation, rehabilitation, or improvement of public land construction, reconstruction, rehabilitation, improvement, alteration, remodeling, enlargement, demolition, removal of extraordinary repairs, public buildings, facilities, assets, works, or infrastructure. For the cost of the feasibility studies and engineering or architectural services for plans and specifications. For the development, design, purchase, and installation of computer hardware or software, or computer-assisted integrated financial systems and accounting systems and any and all costs incidental or related to the above described projects for the purpose of the Boston Public Schools. This was referred to committee on April 8th, 2020. A hearing was held on April 13th, 2020, and it received its first vote on June 3rd, 2020, uh, and was assigned for further action. On page 21 of 23, um, in the Committee on Ways and Means, document number 0595, sponsored by the Mayor, message and order approving appropriation of $12,615,504 for the purpose of paying costs of the Boston Arts Academy, located at 174 Ipswich Street in the City of Boston, including the payment of all costs incidental or related thereto, and for which the City of Boston may be eligible for a grant for the Massachusetts Building Authority, known as the MSBA, said amount to be expended under the direction of the Public Facilities Department on behalf of the Boston Public Schools. Referred to committee on April 8th, 2020. There was a hearing on April 13th, 2020, and it received its first reading on June 3rd, 2020, and was assigned for further action. Um, once again, on page 21 of 23 in the Committee on Ways and Means, docket number 0596, sponsored by the Mayor, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to enter into one or more lease, lease purchase or installment sales agreements in fiscal year 2021 in an account not to exceed $36,400. 
$400,000, excuse me. Um, these funds are to be used by various city departments for the acquisition of equipment in furtherance of their respective governmental functions. The list of equipment includes computer, equipment, hardware, and software, motor vehicles, trailers, ambulances, fire, firefighting equipment, office equipment, telecommunications equipment, photocopying equipment, medical equipment, school and educational equipment, school buses, parking meters, street lighting installations, traffic signals, equipment, and equipment functionally related to or components of the foregoing. This matter was referred to committee on April 8th, 2020. A hearing was held on April 13th, 2020. And this matter received its first reading on June 3rd, 2020, and was referred for, uh, re was referred for further action. And now under matters recently heard, uh, beginning with docket 0796, Message and order for the annual appropriation and tax order for FY 2021. Docket 0797, message and order for the annual appropriation for the school department for FY 2021. Docket number 0798, message and order approving an appropriation of $40 million to the other post-employment benefits known as OPEB Liability Trust Fund, established under Section 20 of the Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 32B. Docket 0799, message and order approving an appropriation of $27,200,000 from the city's capital grant fund in order to provide funding for various transportation and public realm improvements. These projects are aligned with goals of Go Boston 2030, the city's transportation master plan. The funds shall be credited to the capital grant fund from the parking meter fund. And docket number 0800, message and order approving an appropriation of $7 million from the city's capital grant fund to address the impact of transportation network services on municipal roads, bridges, and other transportation infrastructure or any other public purpose substantially related to the operation of transportation network services in the city. Such funds will be transferred and credited to the capital grant fund from revenues received from the Commonwealth's Transportation Infrastructure Enhancement Trust Fund. All matters are now currently and properly before the body. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Clerk. And before I turn it over to Chairwoman Vach, uh, let me just take a moment to offer um, how we'll proceed on voting on the budget. I, I want it, so all of the dockets are before us. Every single budget docket is before us. And I wanna make sure that every colleague has the opportunity to speak to whatever aspect of the budget that they wanna speak to. So I'm recording, we're gonna start with the committee report from our chair of Ways and Means. Um, she will at some point then segue into her um, comments as a counselor from District 8. We will all have the opportunity to make our comments at that time. I'll probably go last. Um, and then if any counselors, and I don't know if you do, and but if anyone has any amendments, we'll deal with amendments when we're reading through the individual dockets. So we'll, we'll do that after we all have a chance to speak, if there are any. If there are not any, we will just go ahead with voting on the dockets and obviously we'll vote uh, individually. All right, and so at this time, I would love to turn it over to our amazing Chairwoman Bach, uh, who will give a committee report. Chairwoman Bach, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I'll, I'll probably mainly speak today in my capacity as Ways and Means Committee Chair, but I will, as the President mentioned, speak briefly at the end for my position as the District 8 City Councilor um, before ceding the floor to my colleagues. And I'll begin today with the operating budget. This budget comes before us at a very hard time, one in which we are confronting systemic racism, police brutality, and deep, in, deep existing inequalities that the economic and public health crisis of COVID-19 are only worsening. Over the past few months, we have held 28 hearings, nine working sessions, and two meetings on the budget, including some, especially recently, at which scores of members of the public have testified. Um, and I'm very grateful to my colleagues um, for attending extensively um, this whole long process. 
Um, as, as folks know, we took an initial vote, rejected the operating budget, most of these dockets um, without prejudice, with the exception of capital, we took an initial vote on back on June 3rd. Um, on June 15th, the mayor resubmitted um, operating education, uh, OPEB, um, the transfer dockets uh, that we'll be discussing today, um, and, and capital remains before us for a second reading um, for folks at home, the way that because capital budgets involve the city going into debt, the city issues bonds in order to do that work, um, there's a legal requirement that the city council twice approve a capital budget at least two weeks apart with a vote of two thirds. And that's meant to make sure that we're um, really thinking about indebting the city um, and, and what we're doing that for. As the chair of Ways and Means, I have resisted um, throughout this process calls to declare my support or opposition to this budget in order to enable our body to push the mayor's administration to meet the moment in as many respects as possible. I was proud to sign the president's letter about our need for a major policy agenda to pick apart systemic racism in this city. And I've been grateful to amplify other calls by my colleagues whenever I hear them. That pressure has yielded some new concrete commitments, some large, some small, and some that we don't have yet. Personally, I'm glad to announce today that in addition to the city's summer jobs program, the administration will be funding at least 1,000 year-round youth jobs this year and has also committed to try to push that number even higher. I mention that specifically because funding 1,000 year-round jobs has been a key demand of many young people who have testified before our committee over the past weeks and months. As someone who believes that a youth job is one of the highest impact things we can do with a marginal dollar of city money for economic empowerment, for leadership development, and for racial justice, I'm pleased to amplify this and others of those advocates' demands. Today, I will be recommending that we vote to pass the proposed operating budget. I wanna speak directly to the people who have written and called my office about why. I wanna talk about strategic reality and about what our viable path is to serious police reform, including, yes, substantial defunding and, e and reallocation. As counselors know, the new money in this budget is going almost exclusively to the types of things that people have been calling for when we talk about shifting our collective priorities. Whereas the overall budget goes up less than 4%, for example, our affordable housing budget increases by 40%, $18 million, um, which is enormous. I wanna live in a city that treats housing as a human right and real increases in city money for housing is part of shifting our fundamental commitment there. You only get a shift in the scale of a department like this once a decade if you're lucky. The budget also increases schools by 80 million and public health by 14 million. There's more money for food access, for language access, for seniors, all places where we desperately need more staff to actually build the city's capacity. If we pass this budget, those new numbers become the new base for all those departments. We reach a high water mark to then try to exceed with more spending and or protect from cuts in the forthcoming economic environment. Whereas if we don't pass a budget and go to a 1 12th budget, we lose these gains in housing and public health and go back to this year's budget allocations, which include also a larger police budget. I have heard these items I wanna save referred to as crumbs by colleagues who have stated in the press that a no vote today gives us the opportunity to push harder and win something bolder and better. A 1 12th for a couple of weeks, they say, is a small price to pay. The immediate layoffs could be quickly reversed. Don't worry, we say to those real people currently providing real services to our residents. If my colleagues had a viable plan, one that I could believe was not gambling with livelihoods and critical services, I would be with them on this. This is a question of political judgment. There's no question. We share politics. We all feel the urgency of this moment but the council cannot speedily negotiate a new better budget from the mayor without a viable counter proposal. That is like saying you can lean out over a cliff but not attaching the rope that is supposed to pull you back. And time is actually against us because as soon as we get updated local aid numbers from the state, which could happen any day, we'll have to revise any potential proposed budget downwards again. And so precisely the money that we're arguing over will slip like sand through our fingers. I say that we don't have a viable counter proposal because no one from this body has proposed any source for more funds for our other priorities besides the police budget. And the same people who have said we could get a better deal have been saying that we should be skeptical about the police cuts already proposed by the administration because they are allowed by law to overspend their police budget. 
So which is it? Are such cuts real or imaginary? I wanna be clear because this is frustrating and complicated. The high overtime costs that we have been discussing as a city in the press are baked into our contract. We can't change them without a renegotiation. If we cut the police budget more deeply, we as a city would have two options. One is to just overspend it and pay the difference out of reserves next year. Given the pandemic emergency situation, that is the most likely scenario. In that case, by passing a fake cut, we would be stealing money from next year's budget, which is going to be more dire because of the economy. The other option would be to commence immediate police layoffs on July 1st, which would follow the agreement with the union and remove our most junior officers first. I have heard people calling for a 10% cut in the police budget. We have all heard it. I wanna be clear that the city budget is mainly personnel. And so a substantial structural cut means cutting jobs. People have again and again compared the scale of our police department to other departments. It's incredible, right? We talk about food access and then we look at police and we say, how can this be the case? Well, it's all a function of staff numbers. We have 18,000 city workers. A little over half of those, 9,600, are teachers. Another 2,900 of them are police officers. Now, the fact that the city employs people is not a reason why we can't make a policy decision to rebalance the size of our departments. It is our job, ours as a city council, in concert with the mayor, to decide collectively about how to prioritize our shared funds. And in this country, and in this city, not just in this country, in this city, we spend too much of that over-policing our black and brown communities. So we urgently need to make this shift. In a moment such as this one, we feel the urgency of immediate change. We have a responsibility to city workers and advocates alike, however, to lay out a meaningful timeline for such shifts and to acknowledge that we need to plan, change contracts, use attrition strategically, and do the other things that you do in order to turn a big ship in order to achieve this kind of organizational restructuring. In the middle of a pandemic where so many have been thrown into unemployment, we need to be thoughtful and compassionate about how we shift personnel. And we have been hearing a call for community per participation in building structural change that can last. I support the goal of a 10% reduction and reallocation of our overall police funding on a timeline that is urgent and tackles the real necessary steps to get new approaches up and running in time for next year's budget. So let me speak briefly, continuing in my capacity as chair, about how the Committee on Ways and Means will pursue that goal if we pass this budget today. At the next council meeting, I will propose four hearings to be held in the next three months. One will be on how we make the proposed overtime cut a reality. We will not just hear from the administration, we will hear from the people who did it under Menino, and we will invite a wider community to discuss the procedural policing decisions that could reduce our overtime hours used, like reducing or eliminating the pretextual stops that are so inexcusably over-targeting our black and brown residents. To the point that I made earlier, I actually expect that we will find in a few weeks when we have the numbers, that overtime from this year that's just run out has passed our budget by about 10, 8 million. So the amount that we could cut here if we really hold the administration accountable to their budget is not just 12 million. It's probably closer to 20 million. That is real money we'll need for everything else in the year ahead. Our committee, after that initial hearing, will also be holding quarterly hearings to track exactly whether we're on track for those overtime savings all year. Meanwhile, the Committee on Ways and Means will also hold a hearing on the police contract as a policy document. From revenue reductions to police accountability reforms, that agreement plays a central role and is up for renegotiation this year. The council and the public cannot sit at the bargaining table, but we can shape the public policy conditions under which that contract is renegotiated, and I intend for us to do so. The third hearing will be on alternative visions for spending part of our police budget. We heard some moving ideas on Monday from people testifying at our budget hearing and we need more time for that joint imagining than could be achieved in three minute public testimony snippets. I hope this visioning work can complement the work on the concrete ordinance introduced by my colleagues today to propose an unarmed community safety crisis response. We need to spend this year designing practices and institutions that could then receive reallocated funds out of our police budget. We will also follow this up with a fourth hearing on participatory budgeting and how the council could better integrate more voices and more community co-governance into our budget process. 
I know, for example, because I heard it, that there is a strong desire for more direct grants to support community-based organizations in this work, especially those that serve Black and Indigenous people of color and LGBTQIA people for whom our traditional public safety infrastructure has long been the most dangerous. I lay out this trajectory because I wanna be clear that we need to be on a path, not just to save that 12 or 20 million from overtime oversight, but to reallocate tens of millions more in our FY22 budget into new options for community care. To get there, we will have to travel a path together. And I am committed to that path and I know many of my colleagues are as well. That path does not have a shortcut in this moment through a 1 12th budget to a magically larger appropriation for these priorities but we are going to use this moment to catapult us down that path. In addition to recommending passage of the operating budget, I am also recommending passage of the education budget. That budget, as I mentioned, is up $80 million or two thirds of the total new revenue we are adding this year. We are in a disaster right now. We are facing enormous learning losses for our students and a situation that just opens the opportunity gap up into a chasm. We need every resource we can muster to tackle that we can't allow the teacher layoffs other districts are making or the Student Opportunity Cut Act budget cuts that the state is threatening. One concern that we heard loud and clear in our committee deliberations is that there is so much that is unknown about COVID. So how do we know if the school budget is accurately allocated? That is obviously the right question for us to be asking. But as city council, officially, our only role is to authorize the top line number of the school budget. And we should make that as high as we can this year, which means passage of this docket. As BPS adapts to deal with the changing COVID situation, it can bring adapted line item budgets before its school committee as per normal procedure. We, the council, should give them all the resources we can. So I'm glad that the administration opted to protect the school budget from any of the cuts related to revenue projections that came in in June. I'm also recommending a positive second vote on the capital budget. This $3 billion capital budget includes a huge number of much needed projects from schools to libraries, to parks, to youth centers, to roads, to safer sidewalks. We can afford to build these now with our bond rating, even as our operating budget may shrink over the next few years and generations of Bostonians will benefit from our present investment. It's also a way to invest counter cyclically in our local economy. We need a robust capital budget for this time and I very much urge a second favorable vote on the capital dockets. Accompanying capital are two more dockets that enable transfers from the parking meter fund and our rideshare fund into transportation related capital projects. I'm recommending passage of those as well. And finally, I recommend that we pass the docket that will put $40 million into our OPEB trust fund, a major unfunded city liability that we need to continue to responsibly pay down. Madam President, those were long remarks in my capacity as chair. I will make very brief ones in my role as district city councilor before seating the floor. There are some really excellent projects in this year's capital budget. I will just mention three of relevance to District 8. The West End Library is slated for a planning study that will let us think about how to revitalize and maximize it as a community treasure for both the West End and Beacon Hill. As one of the most used branch libraries in the system, one that ordinarily, when it's not closed, hosts a food pantry that hosts a huge number of unhoused folks, little kids. It's just, it's a, it's a real center of our life. It could use a major investment in the facilities that it offers for patrons of all ages, while also enlivening its outdoor space and excitingly thinking about it as a potential site for housing above a public asset. Then at the Back Bay Fens, another major capital project, we have the opportunity to invest in making the paths that link this park which is fundamentally designed for walking, making those paths truly accessible, which would be such a major step for parks access for Boston residents with mobility limitations. I'm really excited about that. And then finally, citywide, a doubling in street tree plantings is just so exciting for all of our neighborhoods. Um, and, and I know I, I like many counselors, um, get frequent requests for speeding up that process. In the school's budget, I'm especially encouraged by the extra money for schools that are high on the opportunity index which measures poverty and other complex factors that affect our kids. Without that money, a school like the Tobin in the Mission Hill part of my district ends up with comparatively low per student funding because um, of our weighted student formula, despite including a very large number of homeless or housing insecure students in its student body. 
So they, the Tobin really needs those wraparound supports like social workers that that extra funding can provide. And I'm, I'm excited about that. I've talked about the operating budget extensively, but I'll just name three things I'd like to, like to lift up there. One is again, the trees. I spoke about street tree planting, but I'm so glad that the operating budget contains funding for a citywide urban forestry plan that will help us know where we need street trees and plant them with an eye to real environmental equity across the parts of the city that don't have good tree cover that are experiencing heat island effects. A second item is food access. I've been deeply involved in getting better food access out to folks in my district, including a major delivery to Mission Maine last week. And I've learned how much more systemic staff support we need on that front. The increase in their operating budget is going to be permanent and critical moving forward. Um, and, and I think will help us address uh, issues like the snap gap in the city. Finally, in relation to housing, I wanna highlight the opportunity in this economic crisis for us to use public funds to help secure stable housing for the people too often excluded or displaced from our communities. So with the Acquisition Opportunity Program, AOP, which we're expanding in this budget, we have the potential to stabilize rental properties in the city that go up for sale and make them affordable or even tenant owned for the long term. And then with the One Plus Boston program, which just launched and has a bunch of money in this budget, we have the capacity to support hundreds of first time home buyers getting a foothold here in our community, perhaps in a moment when the market may temporarily be a little softer. I wanna end on this note because I wanna stress again that that housing funding will have a transformative impact on our community in this time of crisis and will be deeply impactful for specific families. This is not a chip to be lightly dealt away. For us to create a city budget that reflects our values and creates the conditions for structural change, we must take this opportunity to lock in major reallocations to housing and public health at precisely the moment when we need them. We must then spend this year making the budgeted reallocation from BPD real and establishing the funds and institutions to which we can reallocate further public safety funds going forward towards serving our communities, especially our communities of color. This is the work ahead. And as I have said, we in the Ways and Means Committee will be continuing that work with hearings on achieving police overtime savings, the police contract, alternative budgeting for community care and participatory budgeting over the weeks to come. I urge passage on all budget dockets. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you so much, Councillor Bach, for that committee report and for your remarks as a district councillor. At this time, we will hear from other colleagues who would like to offer remarks on the budget, give their speech, the entire you know, budget you can speak to or any aspect of the budget that you'd like to speak to by a show of blue hands. I wanna make sure all colleagues have the opportunity if you could just raise your hand. Um, I see that Councillor Asabi George has her blue hand raised, and so I will call upon her next. Councillor Asabi George, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Michelle, Shane, Cora, Kerry, Ashley, Christine, Marlon, Juan, New Lady, Lorraine, Candace, and the rest of Central Staff, if I've missed anyone, for Kerry. their work. For their, oh, Kerry, oh my goodness. No, no, <laughs> Kerry's on my list. Kerry's on my list. Okay but all the central staff for their work on this budget um, and all of our hearings, especially during this time. I'd also like to thank my own team led by my chief of staff, Jessica Rodriguez, uh, for her work. They are the ones behind the scenes who make sure we have had a smooth remote budget process. I also would like to commend and thank Councillor Bach, who has done an incredible job leading us through this budget process in her first year, not just as a counselor, but as chair of the Ways and Means Committee. This has certainly been unprecedented times and she has been a true leader. As her former boss, I knew that she would run a stellar process for our body. And I'm very proud to serve as her vice chair during this time. As an at-large city councilor representing the entire city of Boston, the budget review process is the most important function of my role in public office and has been for me a priority since I took office in 2016. We know this process is one of our most critical responsibilities and it is why I commit to be an active participant. 
My vote today reflects the fact that our spending priorities directly impact our ability to get resources and services out to our residents, which are critical, especially during this pandemic. My vote today does not mean, however, that this is a perfect budget. This is a foundation for the real work that happens after the budget process to build lasting change as we face both a public health crisis and systemic racism. It's an acknowledgement that we have achieved meaningful progress to inv invest in racial equity, mental health, ending homelessness, and programming to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. This budget, as resubmitted, and what we have before us today, increases funding for food access, language access, trauma response, youth programming, and the implementation of eight strategies outlined in Boston's Declaration of Racism as a public health crisis. I'm especially encouraged by these investments and those toward mental health and homelessness, which have been priorities of mine for the past more than four years as chair of the former Committee on Homelessness, Mental Health and Recovery. The additional $2 million of investments towards the Boston Emergency Services Team, or BEST, will support our residents in crisis and in need of a mental health response, not a police response. Since joining this body, I have continued to advocate for and work toward an increased investment. In 2016, we had only two grant-funded positions, and then we added a few to the operating budget. Now we have an investment in a way that creates a robust pro program to serve our residents. This program not only enhances the safety of those struggling with mental illness, but it also places mental health professions, professionals on the scene first, charting a path to treatment instead of jail. Given the surge for mental health services caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, we need this investment today, and I hope we move quickly to realize what this significant investment means for our most, most at-risk residents. Homelessness in the city of Boston is rising, and there is an urgent need to provide adequate resources and support during this pandemic. This problem existed prior to COVID-19 and has only been magnified these past months, with thousands of in individuals desperately in need of supports and our 5,000 school children experiencing homelessness. We need to double down on the efforts already underway. The new funding for the Family Homelessness Advisor for the Department of Neighborhood Development is incredibly important. This new position is a giant step forward, and I hope will lead to an actionable and concrete plan, one that I have drafted with the help of countless advocates to end family homelessness in the city of Boston and to support the efforts of the commission I have called for. This special commission to end family homelessness in the city of Boston will hold us accountable to this goal, and with this new position, I see the true possibility to end homelessness for our families in Boston. I believe that the additional $2 million in the resubmitted budget for additional housing support for youth homelessness programs will help us further close the gap on the number of youth experiencing homelessness in our city. As chair of the Education Committee, I have thoughtfully considered my vote. I acknowledge again that this is not a perfect budget, but it includes fundamentally necessary investments in our schools. In order to set up our children for success and resolve systemic failures in our school system, the social, emotional, behavioral, mental, and physical well being of our children must be a priority. Included in the education budget are investments in social workers to meet the social, emotional needs of our students and families. It means we can continue to hire nurses in order to fully achieve the obligations of having a full time nurse in all of our, our schools. It means we can expand access to arts, music, science, physical education, and health in grades K to six. It means we can expand access to menstrual products in our schools. That we can increase special education teachers and paraprofessionals in our classrooms. It means we add family liaisons to our schools. It means that we increase funds to support students with autism. I acknowledge that the education budget can be better. We need to increase funding to have more mental health professionals in our schools, improve and expand our school libraries, so every school not only has a library, but a full-time librarian, and inclusion needs to be done right. These are investments 
plus others that will help improve the services provided and su the support and to support the needs of our students. My vote today serves to recognize the importance of those investments, but also the work that is still needed to provide our kids with the education they deserve. This is a very difficult time in our city. I am moved by and applaud the residents of Boston and my colleagues for their advocacy for change. We need to dig up the root causes of systemic racism that no budget alone will solve. We need to revise how the city and departments negotiate contract agreements. We need to look at our, all of our departments across the board to implement better policies. We need more mental health professionals and improved trauma response. However, I'm also aware that there are many who can't wait for another revision. Our families experiencing homelessness cannot wait. Our families in need of food access throughout this pandemic and beyond cannot wait. Our seniors in need of services cannot wait. And our small businesses cannot wait. The fight for change does not end with today's budget vote. For me, this is where the rest of the work needs to start and how I have designed my work on the council since joining this body. We begin anew today and we each have a roadmap now laid out before us on what remains undone. I encourage all who have engaged with us in this process to stay involved. I will be here and hope you will continue to work alongside me. Those who see this passage as defeat will need you, we need you to help us continue our work on behalf of the residents of this great city. Today, I will vote to approve all of the budgets before us, including the capital, operating, and education budgets. To those watching at home, I think I can speak for all of my colleagues when I say that the level of engagement, participation, and advocacy in this year's budget process was instrumental to achieving meaningful investments in this resubmitted budget. I'd like to thank all of our residents for pushing the conversation about racism, policing, and public health. Your advocacy produced real tangible investments towards building a city that we deserve, a city that acknowledges their history of systemic racism, and a city committed to building lasting change. And while the budgets are far from perfect, I am encouraged by the new investments in urgent priorities, many of which are the direct result of advocacy and activism from past budget cycles. Ultimately, good government means having a working government and a responsible government. With the uncertainty created by the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic and the need to begin meaningful reforms today, I believe we need to continue moving forward for a successful recovery. I believe that failing to pass a budget does a disservice to the work up to this point. I believe that this budget serves as a strong foundation for the work ahead, and there is much work ahead. I look forward to continuing this work with the res residents of Boston, with my colleagues on the council, and the administration. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you so much, Councillor Asabi George. The chair recognizes Councillor Flynn. Councillor Flynn, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Um, first, I want to thank Councillor Bach for her tireless work on this budget process. Um, she did an outstanding job. I also want to thank the mayor's team as well for working closely with the city council. I also want to thank central staff. Um, Councilor Sabi George mentioned them by name, uh, but again, just want to say thank you to the people behind the scenes that did a tremendous amount of work for us to make this happen. Um, I also want to thank the residents of the city and advocates who have been very active and engaged during this time. This is an important budget, and I know that we are trying to have a fiscal, fiscally responsible budget that can deliver the services and resources that our constituents need, as well as respond to the needs of racial equity. This budget makes large investments in affordable housing, education, public health, food access, services for immigrants, and other areas. There is a $80 million increase for the Boston Public School System, $13 million for Boston Public Health Commission, $18 million in housing investments. 
There is also new funding for the Boston Public Library, Parks, and the Human Rights Commission. I represent a large immigrant community in District 2. And included in this budget are increases in funding for the Office of Immigrant Advancement, Office of Language and Communication Access, which will further help my constituents in Chinatown, the South End, and South Boston, and elsewhere. We're trying to access resources like interpretation, legal advocacy, and housing. At a time when human, at a time when the rights of our immigrants are under constant threat, we need funding for these off, offices, offices to do their work and to advocate for our immigrant communities. During this pandemic, our immigrant communities have face the brunt of the effects from COVID-19 in our AAPI community has especially been impacted by discrimination and racism. So I'm glad to know that the Human Rights Commission is funded in this budget to do the work in addressing race, racism and discrimination, bullying, intimidation, and could potentially be an outlet for our immigrant communities and communities of color to seek support where they experience discrimination. I want to thank Mayor Walsh for his work on the Human Rights Commission. I think it's an incredible tool for the city to use in addressing discrimination in our city. If we, approve, if we don't approve this budget, there will not be funding for the Human Rights Commission. We won't be able to utilize this department to fight for the rights of our residents. I also, like a lot of my colleagues, represent a large, a large number of seniors. And during this pandemic, we've seen the importance of food access, especially for our seniors. Like you, I've delivered food to seniors in housing complexes, and I know that food access will be a critical issue going forward. This budget has investments in the Office of Food Access, which would help enable the elderly persons with disabilities and others in need, of, in need to access nutritional food. Aside from that, I have to consider what would happen if we don't have an approved budget. We, we would, as Council Bach mentioned, go into a 112 budget based on last year's approved budgets and revenues, which means that we can potentially lose the investments included in this proposed budget and make cuts. With the current uncertainty in this economy, some city departments may struggle to pay their costs and ultimately have to lay off dedicated city workers. I'm proud of the work that our city workers do every day in our city. From our teachers, school nurses, police officers, firefighters, EMTs, youth counselors, substance use disorder counselors, custodians, traffic engineers, to our parks department and public works department workers, and so many others. They keep our city moving forward. Probably the highlight of, of my last two years as a city councilor is meeting the dedicated city workers that we see every day. I love spending the weekend in my district, talking to the city workers that are emptying the barrel or the Hokies that are sweeping the street. Those are, those are the unsung heroes in our city. In the, middle, in the middle of an economic crisis, it is critical for us as a city to do all we can to keep people employed so that they can pay their rent or mortgage, buy their groceries and support our local restaurants and small businesses and to help Boston recover from what could be a very long and deep lasting recession. I also understand that there are calls to reallocate more funding from the Boston Police to other programs and departments. The discussion on racial equity and justice must continue. And there is much more work to be done in terms of reform. I believe that voting for this budget does not mean that we won't be able to address issues of accountability. I am committed, and I know my colleagues are as well, 
but I am committed to working with, with you, with Mayor Walsh, with civic groups and community activists, the residents of Boston, to further racial justice in our city and to ensure that our police department continues to strive to be more inclusive, equitable, and empowering. Ultimately, I believe this budget that makes much needed investments for our city during this current public health and economic crisis, as well as taking steps in the right direction to address racial equity. This work will continue, but voting for this budget will preserve important investments in housing, education, public health, immigrant services, and other vital areas during these uncertain times for our city and for our country. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you so much, Councillor Flynn. Uh, just a reminder to colleagues, trying to keep track of the queue. So if you raise your blue hand, we'll have you in the queue. At this time, the chair recognizes Councillor Edwards. Councillor Edwards, you have the floor. Councillor Edwards, Councillor Edwards, I think you're on mute. If you would start again, thank you. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. I can hear you. Well, my apologies. Um, I'll begin again. I wanted to first thank um, my, the central staff, as my colleagues have echoed the immense amount of work that they have done and adjusted without complaint, without question, uh, to assure that we are meeting our obligation. We cannot hear you. I am so sorry. Councillor Edwards, would you like for me to come back to you after you figure out your sound issue? Thank you. Okay, we're gonna come right back to you after the next speaker, okay? So at this time, the chair recognizes Councillor Arroyo. Councillor Arroyo, you have the floor. Thank you, am I coming through loud and clear? I can hear you. Can everyone hear Councillor Arroyo? Good. Thank you. Our budget is a reflection of our values. I'd like to say thank you to the advocates, everyone who called, everyone who emailed on behalf of a vision for the city that lives up to its promise and potential, especially my constituents who have been tireless in their advocacy. Throughout my campaign to represent this district, I promise to center justice and equity in every decision that I make as a Boston City Councilor from District 5. That is the lens through which I evaluated this budget. The police overtime budget, much has been made of it. It's $48 million in this resubmission. That $48 million accounts for is 165% more than BCYF's budget. That's our community center, the Boston Central for Youth and Families. It's 165% larger than that, just the overtime. The Boston Police overtime, our fair housing and equity budget is $317,000. $317,500 in this budget for fair housing and equity in a time in which we are leaning into probably uh, a record high in evictions and foreclosures. That budget is... 15,100% more, that overtime budget, than Fair Housing and Equity's entire budget for the city in this budget. For Age Strong, which deals with our seniors, their budget is $4.4 .4 million. The BPD overtime budget is 1,080% higher than Age Strong's budget. For the Commission for Persons with Disabilities, their entire budget and here in this budget is $510,616. That would put the BPD overtime budget at 9,400 times more than the Commission for Persons with Disabilities budget. The Office of Immigrant Advancement in my district, immigrants make up 40% of my district. That office's budget in this budget is $1.1 million. For the BPD overtime budget, that's 4,260 times more than what we put into the Office for Immigration Advancement. When you get to the vets, our Boston veterans who have served this country, their budget is $4,612,875, which puts the BPD overtime budget at 1,040 more percent than the vets budget. For youth engagement and employment, that is 7.8 million. 
for the BPD overtime budget, that's 610 percent more than that. With the Public Works Department, it's the equivalent to half of their entire budget. The BPD overtime budget is the equivalent of nearly half of the entire Public Works Department. For the Emergency Management Office, in which we are in an emergency, their BPD overtime budget is 4,875 percent more than the Office of Emergency Management. The Office of Emergency Management in this budget has $985,000. It's a very different problem. The Boston Fire Department, for instance, in this budget, their Boston Police Department budget is 185 times more than what the Boston Fire Department's overtime budget is. And when we just talk about total budgets, when we just speak on what we give entirely, the entire Health and Human Services Cabinet is, this budget is 250 times more than that budget, the entirety of the Boston Police Department budget. And so I've heard about vague potential harm that may come with the rejection of this budget. The word devastation was used, but not nearly enough has been said about those harmed and devastated by generations of underfunding for whom this budget does not go nearly far enough in meeting this moment or their needs. We took a moment of silence. For me, it was quite emotional. Eight minutes and 46 seconds. It felt incredibly long. It was very painful. Now imagine waiting decades for funding in your communities and being told to wait with an impending recession in which every conversation that this that we have had about budgets is that we won't have more money to allocate in next year's budget or the budget after that. We'll be protecting allocations and being told to wait for next year for that money that we've talked about not being present will be there for that. And so the realities in Boston are stark. The average net worth of a black Bostonian right now is $8. The average net worth of a white Bostonian is $250,000. 99% of this city, our city's contracts go to white men. All of those things are products of systemic racism. And so I asked myself, Does this budget reflect the love that I have for my communities? Does it go far enough in providing a much needed hand up to those who are most devastated by this pandemic and centuries of systemic racism? Does it create enough opportunities for those that seek them and have traditionally been excluded from them? Does it inject enough resources to reverse centuries of underfunding and disenfranchisement? Is this operations budget just? Is it equitable? The answer for me is no. And so is my vote. Thank you, Councillor Arroyo. At this time, we're going to check back in with Councillor Edwards. Councillor Edwards, are you doing okay with your technology? Okay, not hearing from Council. Oh, wait a minute. Councillor Edwards? I think Councillor Edwards is still having some technical difficulties, so we will continue to move along. At this time, the chair recognizes Councillor Campbell. Councillor Campbell, you have the floor. Uh, Thank you, Madam President. And of course, thank you to Councillor Kinsey Bach uh, for spearheading our budget process. Thank you to our central staff. Thank you to the administration. Uh, Thank you to the budget office. And of course, thank you to my team. Over the last few weeks and days, I have reviewed thousands of emails, called back and intently listened to residents, constituents, city employees, advocates, colleagues, and other stakeholders' concerns with respect to our FY21 budget. On the one hand, residents are demanding systemic change, including a reduction in the police budget to reinvest that money in youth jobs, housing, healthcare, education, and community programs. On the other hand, city employees are in fear of losing their jobs or are worried that not approving this budget will further separate and divide our city. Officers are worried about how they will respond to incidents of violence, including homicides, with one occurring in my district just yesterday. Community-based organizations are worried about their bottom line and ability to provide services. The truth of the matter is all these perspectives are valid. However, The implication that rejecting the budget would be the council's failure to deliver on proving or providing essential funding for our departments and programs is ridiculous. 
when it is the mayor's budget that is unsatisfactory and doesn't go far enough to respond to the desperate needs of our communities. We need a budget that residents in every single neighborhood in the city of Boston feel is working for them, where their needs and best interests are seen and responded to. With respect to this budget, I've heard from too many constituents, including some city employees, we'll take what we can get. Communities of color have been taking what they can get out of this process year after year. In 2017, when I worked with the mayor to establish a youth development fund, and I asked for it to start at $1 million, we got only $250,000, I along with the youth organizations that were pushing for that fund. And we said, we'll take what we can get. But over the last few months, we've seen a public health crisis that has absolutely devastated communities of color, revealed the long-standing health inequities, economic inequities, educational inequities that disproportionately hurt communities of color. And we've seen a national movement to support black lives and invest in communities of color. It's not good enough for us to take what we can get out of our budget. I know we are still in the midst of a public health crisis that is hurting our economy and making a lot of decisions about our and making a lot of decisions about the future uncertain. But how many times in our history have we told people of color to wait for another time or another moment? As a native Bostonian, a Boston Public Schools graduate, a city councilor representing a district that is predominantly a district of color, and by certain metrics, one of the poorest in the city of Boston. And as a black woman, I have been consistent in naming the reality we all should be concerned about. Long before COVID-19 and the murder of George Floyd, Boston was found to be one of the most unequal cities in this country. The median net worth of a black family, $8, while for a white family, $247,500. In Back Bay, the average person lives to the age of 92. A few miles away in Roxbury, the average lifespan is just under 59 years old. Children in our downtown neighborhoods have an 80% chance of attending a high quality BPS school. When children in Mattapan, where I live with my two-year-old and six-month-old, only have a 5% chance. In some neighborhoods in my district, almost every household on the block has felt the impact of mass incarceration with a loved one and or a neighbor incarcerated. Some of our business districts are thriving, but others like Codman Square and Mattapan Square have been left behind and lack strategic investment. Less than 1% of our city contracts go to businesses owned by women and people of color. Developers and business owners who are people of color tell me they, are often, they often have trouble getting contracts or projects outside of neighborhoods of color, limiting their opportunity to provide jobs to residents of color and of course expanding their business. In some neighborhoods, you're hard pressed to find a sit down restaurant or a locally owned coffee shop open past four and the list goes on. I know our residents want us to work together to challenge the status quo, adopt bold policies that address these inequities at their roots. I have always attempted to work in partnership with the mayor and administration, not just naming the problem, but offering up concrete solutions and ideas that have often went nowhere, were met with resistance, dismissed as controversial or impractical, or just completely ignored. In addition to the Youth Development Fund, which is still only funded at $500,000, in the last two years, I've released two sets of policy recommendations, each one informed by residents and advocates, one on how to increase diversity in our public safety agencies, another on equity in education. And I've yet to see these recommendations be engaged and adopted in a meaningful way. It took two years for a program with a proven record and reputation of building wealth to be made available to residents in my public housing, public housing facilities. Even getting data from our departments has been a challenge. I could go on, but the point I want to make is that I, with, I along with many colleagues and our incredible resident leaders, have been sounding the alarm on ways to address existing and persisting inequities. And today, with this budget, we are far from addressing these decades of concern. These last few years and long before I got to the council, there have been missed opportunities for us as a city to intentionally invest and implement policies to seriously address racial inequities, not just by this mayor, but others before him. Opportunities that if taken would put us in a different position today. If we do not take bold steps in our budget now and truly use an equity lens to look at who is being served by this budget, 
we will be here in 10, 20, or 30 years discussing the same achievement and opportunity gaps. This budget should be doing more to intentionally and aggressively address health disparities, to close the race or wealth gap, to close opportunity and achievement gaps for our young people with targeted investments for off-track students and to address their learning loss due to COVID-19, as well as increased investments in youth jobs and development programs. The BPS budget has barely changed since it was first submitted in April, when we were in the peak of COVID-19 and remote learning. While I applaud investments made to increase the number of school counselors and social emotional supports, it is still a business as usual budget for an unprecedented time. I am still disappointed that the district has not shared publicly data on how students were impacted by remote learning and what the projected learning loss will be. We need to adjust that budget to the reality of the pandemic, which will likely require our students to attend school remotely in the fall and address learning loss due to COVID-19, particularly for Brown and Black students, English language learners, and our special needs students. Beyond the COVID crisis, it is critical that BPS develop a specific plan to increase access to quality school seats for students in every neighborhood and to show that they're listening to school communities by giving school leaders and teachers more autonomy over their budgets to more effectively serve their unique student populations. We must reallocate more of our police budget and adopt more specific proposals to transform our policing system so it's more accountable, transparent, diverse, and just. The BPD budget is the second largest in the entire budget. What does that say about our values? Policing, yes, serves a major role, but it does not solve or address the root causes of crime and violence, which are linked to poverty and inequities in access to quality jobs, school, schools, and housing. Yet policing is where the bulk of our resources are going. $12 million from the police overtime budget is a bare minimum response. With no plan to change the regulations through collective bargaining, we won't necessarily see any reduction in spending. To those who say there is no counter offer, there is and has been for decades. There is no shortage of actionable steps the mayor could take or at least commit to publicly, including his stance on the four hour minimum and police officer detail spending, adopting a specific action plan and timeline to immediately increase and expand the number of high quality BPS school seats in every neighborhood in the city, a position on civil service, which has long served as a barrier to entry for women and people of color, to join our public safety agencies, a detailed and specific strategy to eradicate health inequities in communities of color, and most important, a review of every department's budget to ensure it is evaluated through a racial equity lens, not just our streets and sidewalks program, but all of our departments. The mayor says that Boston is going to be a leader in racial equity, yet this budget does not just demonstrate a commitment to that goal. Delaying and resubmitting in a timely manner should not be considered unreasonable. And we can do this in such a way that city employees do not lose their jobs, even if that means creating specific plans and commitments that have to be monetarily realized with external resources. We can and should create a revised budget that maintains critical investments while meeting the needs of our residents that this moment demands, that shows greater intentionality to lift up our communities out of poverty, invest in public health over policing, ensures, ensures kids in every neighborhood of color have equi equitable access to a high quality education. In other words, that seeks to eliminate inequities that have made communities of color and low income communities less resilient and more vulnerable to public health and economic crises. I love my city and I cannot in good conscience in this time and historic moment, vote in favor of this budget. I have voted against the budget in past years, sometimes standing alone, but for the same exact reasons I am today. But this year feels a little different because we all are feeling and seeing the cost of inaction. Some are experiencing it more personally and more painful than others. My district has disproportionately suffered losses due to COVID-19, been disproportionately impact by, impacted by policing and incarceration, and is still losing residents to homicide, including one on Monday in Dorchester, and has historically suffered from under-resourced school, housing, green spaces, and transit. Given the authority that I have as a counselor to vote yes or no on an entire budget, this vote will not be enough to ensure that one zip code does not determine one's ability to get a good paying job, access a quality education, or for, afford a home, 
or feel valued and safe in one's community. But I do know that our votes can send a strong message to the mayor and administration that a timid response to the organizing and calls for action to shift our budget so it's more equitable and anti-racist is not enough. Enough is enough and gradual will no longer do. For these reasons, I am voting against the operating budget as well as the BPS budget. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you so much. At this time, we are gonna go back to Councillor Edwards. Councillor Edwards. Am Oh, great. Can you hear me? Oh my goodness. Wonderful, excellent. Councilor Edwards, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, I, I was, let me begin. First, I wanna thank my, uh, the central staff and the amazing work that they have done uh, for this. They, without complaint, have adjusted, have readjusted. Uh, and I think we're probably, uh, we haven't missed a meeting. Uh, and it's really in part because of their incredible creativity and their ability to rise to the occasion every time we ask them to in more than one language. I want to also just uh, tip my hat and tip my head to um, our, our newest colleagues. I cannot imagine uh, being a new city council in the orientation that you have in a pandemic in the middle of the largest civil rights movement um, and also taking on the incredible leadership that you have. I want to thank you each uh, of you for your leadership and your voice and you're just jumping right in. Uh, today, I'm going to address, all, you can hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, sorry, just a little insecure. Uh, today, I'm gonna to address all three, three budgets. I wanna first talk about the school budget. The school budget specifically, I voted that down last year because I felt that while there was a systemic issue of $1 billion within my district, there was an inequity built in with that, within that budget. Uh, we had, as a community, called for certain reforms. Uh, we, we especially needed to make sure that there were more child seats in Charlestown. We needed to make sure that there were more middle school seats in East Boston, and the budget didn't respond to that. Instead, it cut East Boston's high school. This year, I'm proud to say I am voting for the school budget, in part because of their response to prior COVID calls to reform our system in District 1 and to make sure that the Edwards Middle School becomes and maintains itself as an education facility, but providing more room for folks in Charlestown to be able to either have an early child center or an early more uh, pre-K and K-1 and K-0 seats. At the same time, allowing for uh, reducing the, the school budget uh, by almost $400,000 because we no longer would need to transfer kids from East Boston over to Charlestown to go to the Edwards. I want to say that I also feel that there's been a true response and there's active, actively moving to take our, our grades, our high schools from, from nine to 12 to seven to 12. Those things I think keep families in the school system. They keep them dedicated to their teachers, to their education, and they grow a community. I'm beyond uh, excited about that commitment that I have received personally from the superintendent. That being said, we were hit with COVID and East Boston in particular is the number one food site for, um, for kids. And we also happen to be the number one applica applicants for the rental assistance program. We're hurting is what I'm trying to say. And BPS and to the teachers in my district especially, thank you. Thank you so much. I sat in on your equity roundtables. I see the work that you are doing and I can't think of an, any other way to compliment your work than to push for a budget that funds you, that keeps you, that prevents your layoffs. It, it, it maintains the course. At the same time, I believe that there's such flexibility and so many things that we are not clear about what's going to happen that to cut now and then say adjust to BPS is insulting. I'd rather give them the flexibility to move. And I believe they built that flexibility in. Also because the state house has signaled very clearly that despite the years long advocacy, for the Student Opportunity Act, that they will not fulfill their promise. We can't do that to our teachers and to our students. We cannot afford to not fulfill our promises. So I'm gonna stand with you, hold you accountable the entire time, and make sure that BPS is as strong as it possibly can be in this incredibly difficult time. I swing over to the capital budget. I will be voting in favor of that to assure that uh, there are certain projects throughout my district that help my community continue to grow. We're talking about uh, the pools in East Boston, the Senior Center, we're discussing uh, the North Washington Bridge, 
We're looking at so many different, the actual um, study for the Edwards Middle School in Charlestown. There's millions of dollars, the library in, in the North End. All of these things are vital uh, to building a community. And these are one-time investments that we, I will not throw away. I will not throw away. So I want, I want to say I will be voting for the capital budget. I have longer remarks, as many of my colleagues have, however, for the operating budget. Let me, first by, let me first begin by saying over the past weeks, I have received an extraordinary, an extraordinary amount of calls and emails from constituents about this issue, constituents in my district and constituents throughout Boston and other cities as well. I want to thank actually everyone for their time and for for bothering to reach out to me in a constructive manner. Those that went beyond the hashtags and the tweets and wrote those long emails about the impact of a yes or no vote. I wanna say thank you. I will get back to you personally and I will do my best to acknowledge and, 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 and be held accountable by you for whatever decision I make. I appreciate your thoughts. I appreciate your vulnerability. This moment, as many of my colleagues have said, this is something special about today and this time and this budget. This is not the time to shy away. This is the time to rise to the occasion. This is the time to hear the call and the call is for structural change. I wanna say I hear that call and I've heard that call many times. I wanna thank Councillor Bach for her proposal for how to answer that structural change. Her proposal is called leadership. Her proposal hears the number, gives a plan, and discusses how we will together as a community get there. Let's be clear, we would all and should be fired if we can make a yes or no decision on tens of millions of dollars. That's irresponsible. So, but I'm, I'm not gonna cheerlead this budget like some of my colleagues did. Um, I'm not gonna cheerlead it. I know that there are many things in there that are good for housing, something you know is near and dear to me. City vouchers, rent vouchers, many things about immigrant services, the ability for us to um, get a lot of social services done, the Human Rights Commission. I think it's, it's good that there's funding. I think $500,000 is nowhere near enough. But I wanna be clear, I am really disappointed that this conversation seems to have pitted those social services and those people of color um, against the police. That is disappointing. The question before us is does an up or down vote give us structural change? The answer is no, neither one actually does it. Neither one makes black or brown people more free, solves poverty, ends homelessness, reforms one police officer, or even defunds the police. Neither decision. Voting no on this year's budget is not going to bring about systemic change that we need at this time. And I don't think any of my colleagues have said that. It's about the statement of what that no means. Now, to those who are disappointed or wanted me to vote absolutely no with no conditions, I would say you're more disappointed, or you should be more disappointed, because you place your beliefs for systemic reform in the, and hopes for systemic reform in a flawed, oppressive process. You thought we could undo the master's house with the master's tools. We cannot. Unfortunately, too many of the folks who want a no vote were okay with layoffs, some layoffs, of some of the unsung heroes that Councilor Flynn discussed. Hokies, part-time workers, seasonal workers, some of the youngest workers who aren't yet actually protected by the union. If you'll note the saying, last in, is first out, is oftentimes the most diverse workforce and the youngest. Those, who's, those are whose jobs we're gonna play Russian roulette with in a pandemic, in a recession, and I'm not willing to treat those workers as cannon fodder in any cultural war. I'm told that it won't be that bad or that it's overstated or that in three, four days we can all work it out. It's not my job that's at risk. 
And the people who are saying that, it's not their jobs or their monies or their savings or their or their bills or their stress or their heart, <laughs> heart condition or their ability to pay their co-pays. None of that is at risk either. I think it's interesting that so many people truly believe, as I do, that people closest to the pain should be closest to the power. I believe that 100%. This is not a call to say not to do that. So I'm wondering when those folks were saying cut the budget and they heard about layoffs, how many of them turned to those people who are gonna be close to that pain and asked them what they thought about the layoffs? How many of them were part of this decision that they were gonna be the ones that could be sacrificed? I'm curious with the grassroots movement, how many workers were asked what are your opinions? I truly believe those people should be at the table. And that's why I think the table set and described by Councilor Bach, a longer process that gets to the 10% reduction is the fair table. I ran on being a voice and not an echo. I stand in my own two feet I don't need the hashtags. I don't need the, the talking points. I don't need those things because I'm very clear and I'm direct with where I stand and for whom. I have been consistent and I will hold my rec up to, record up to any one of my colleagues about pushing for structural change from day one and getting it done. I challenge anyone to question my character and I'll be damned if anyone questions my blackness or my solidarity for people of color in any way, shape or form based on any vote I take as a city councilor. You do not, you need to stand down. I have gotten ridiculous text messages, horrific things said about me. And let me tell you something, still I rise. Let me tell you what I'm gonna rise to the occasion for this year for structural change. First, I have risen for structural change and I'm getting done a zoning amendment that is going to plan for the first time we will be planning for equity, improving plans on how they integrate our city based on class, based on race, based on vulnerable populations. We are going to do that. That takes time. That's not an up or down vote. I am going to pass this year with my colleagues, I am going to pass the home rule petition that I introduced that reforms the zoning board of appeal. It adds additional seats for an environmentalist, it adds additional seats for a urban planner, and it will absolutely change the standard for which we grant variances or exceptions to the rule. We got a lot of things done in the executive order. We're not finished and that home rule will be going to the state house. Yes, I stood here already with my colleagues to ban facial recognition, that's structural. Yes, my colleagues and I are creating a fourth first responder team this year. I'm committing to you to that as your government ops chair. And yes, without a doubt, we are going to thoroughly examine and cut back on the police overtime budget as their contract needs to be approved by the city council. But most importantly, I intend to break the wheel of this merry-go-round farce of budget negotiations. I am sick of it. It does nothing but pit us against each other. I'm calling for an overhaul of our charter. I actually already filed that. And specifically, I will be calling in the next couple of weeks for a dramatic shift of budgetary powers to the city council. The next time someone asks me to defund and add money someplace, I want to be able to respond, how much, when, how, and let's negotiate. I can't do that now. I wanna be able to answer the call and the cry for participatory budgeting. I wanna be able to generate a budget and I wanna have line item vetoes and then be able to add that money. And that requires structural change, not an up or down vote, it requires us to change the charter. That also requires us to put it to the ballot so that the voters have a real voice, have a real voice in how we're going to change how, how the city is run. This is structural and it's really hard and it takes a lot of work. The fact is the easiest thing I could do is vote no on this budget. Run off with hashtags, and say, hey, I'm gonna vote no to make a statement. That's easy. But I didn't take this job for the easy. 
the temporary victories for the moments. I'm in it for the long haul. That's systemic. I'm voting for the budget and pushing for real change right now, and I'm winning. I can tell you, I can tell you what a yes vote will actually bring to my district and what policies a yes vote will, bring, will actually create. I'm still waiting, honestly, to know what the no vote will do for my district or for my policies. I can't, actually I won't say to any worker that they are worth the sacrifice, even temporarily, even, even causing them the stress that they could lose their job for an undefined goal with an undefined timeline. You want change? It's time to really push for it. That requires a lot more work. I'm in it for that. I have the record to prove it. I got all the receipts in all colors. I'm going to vote for the operations budget and fight like hell for the structural change that I just listed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councillor Edwards. The chair recognizes Councillor Flaherty. Councillor Flaherty, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Madam President. Uh, take this opportunity to, to thank uh, Chairwoman Bach uh, for an outstanding job and process, particularly during uh, the pandemic, but also just the way that she uh, laid out uh, the budget uh, in her opening remarks, as well as the plan uh, that she has uh, for us moving forward. Also thank her entire staff, all of our central staff, particularly Michelle, our Director of Legislative Budget and Analysis, and also Kerry and Candace for the work that they did keeping the virtual hearings streaming over the course of these last few months. Also thanking uh, folks in my staff, uh, Ryan, uh, Samantha, Alicia, Quinn, uh, Paul, Trish, for the work that they've done uh, throughout the pandemic and throughout the budget process. So we haven't missed a beat uh, in servicing the residents across the city. And also want to thank everyone who reached out to my office, uh, as well as my colleagues' offices about this budget. Uh, their opinions uh, and their points of view mattered and uh, appreciate uh, their willingness to get involved, uh, particularly in the representative government. Uh, this budget is responsible, it's sensible, and it's workable uh, in light of the larger fiscal uh, uncertainty that we're in uh, as a result of COVID-19. We need financial predictability and stability now more than ever. There is a narrative that, uh, that's, uh, that's out there that's, that say that discussing the financial realities of our state and city in light of COVID-19 are doom and gloom. There's also a presentation of a false choice of layoffs and financial ruin on one side, and on the other side, opportunities for the transformation and systemic change in a resubmitted budget. Uh, I agree with my colleagues that, uh, that uh, we, we are presenting people with, uh, with a false choice, uh, that this idea that a yes vote indicates a sense of complacency with the way our institutions, education, public safety operate, and that a no vote represents a desire and willingness to, to work for transformational and meaningful change. You know, budgets are our value statements. I believe that, and, and they should be aspirational, uh, but they also need to be operational. The cuts in services in personnel that could happen as a result of going to a 112 are very, very real. Just the other day, the Suffolk County District Attorney started furloughs. I believe within the last 24 hours, the University of Massachusetts is, talking, is starting their layoffs. That is going to continue to happen uh, in the weeks and months ahead. So it's real. Uh, there's no posturing. Uh, those are the facts. If we have uh, last year's revenues with this year's costs, it's inevitable that programs will cease, the indoor be merged, or we'll lose programming, and we'll also lose personnel, as our colleagues have referenced, uh, some of those unsung heroes of the city. It'll be the it'll be the the 90 day appointments. It'll be the seasonal workers that uh, that uh, that go first and. And that goes right to basic city services, which our residents have, have come to expect. So um, the reality of our economic situation is not exaggerated. Our state aid right now is projected to decline conservatively by $9 million. Uh, department revenue is down by $5 million. Uh, excise tax revenue, the bottom fell out of the fourth quarter. Uh, it's down by $38 million, uh, which is a 20% overall reduction. It's also very likely that uh, by waiting for the state to set the official local aid numbers, we may even have to come back and cut this budget even further. That's real. There's no, it's not pie in the sky. It's, it's not sort of uh, any doom and gloom. Those, that's the reality. Those are the facts, given what's, uh, what's impacted and, and how COVID has impacted our city. 
this budget makes uh, transformative investments in our city's efforts around affordable housing and homelessness, education, public health, youth programming, workforce development, environmental and climate resiliency, parks and rec, urban forestry, vision zero and transportation, mental health, trauma response, so many, many other areas. This budget invests 1.26 billion with a B in our schools, an overall $80 million increase for BPS and an additional 17 million for charter schools. Uh, the budget can also be hugely boosted by improved funding from the Student Opportunity Act, uh, which all of our city leaders have publicly advocated for. This budget represents quality investments in our efforts around access to affordable housing through DD's budget even prior to the reinvestment in the resubmitted budget with an increase of nearly 32%. Those are resources that are being allocated despite our federal government largely walking away from affordable and subsidized housing. Outside the budget, there is legislation at the State House that if passed, uh, will increase our city's ability to further support affordable housing efforts and, and workforce development. This budget invests in public health. 106 million for Boston Public Health Commission, 3 million allocated specifically to fund eight key strategies addressing and combating racism, which we as a body, uh, led by our colleague, uh, Councilor Royo, uh, and obviously our mayor and the administration, have recognized as a public health crisis. I have long been an advocate for year-round jobs for our youth. Our youth engagement and employment budget and BCYF programming has increased again this year. And yes, we need to continue to invest in these programs and our kids year after year after year. The capital budget includes fundings for new programs um, at, uh, in, a, in a parks across uh, the city uh, as a result of constituents advocating for those investments. I'm also, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, recognize uh, our Boston police officers. They've taken a lot of punches over the last few weeks. Uh, they do tremendous work for our city. Uh, they're great partners for us, as I referenced earlier. Last year, 600, over 683,000 911 calls of police officers and, and, and our other public safety personnel. This year alone, in the first five months, it's over 310,000. Those calls keep coming in. When people are running away from those calls, it's the men and women of the Boston Police Department that are running toward those calls. And uh, I, I, just, I just feel that they need to be recognized uh, for, for that work. They also uh, are willing uh, to stand with us and to be part of the reforms that we're talking about going forward. Um, you know, so it's uh, you know, managing uh, the work that they have to do, uh, the caseload that they have, the volume of calls that they have. Uh, unfortunately, there's no mechanism right now in place to how we shift public safety responsibilities to other community-based support systems. There's also no clear way as to how we can re-engineer our public safety operations before July 1st. Uh, and again, those 911 calls are going to continue to come in. So our, our communities uh, would, would be put in a vulnerable position and our offices would, 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 uh, we would be doing a huge disservice to the men and women of the police department. This budget uh, does a lot of good for our city. Um, and we can continue to do a lot of good outside of this budget as referenced by uh, several of my colleagues uh, today. Um, and we can continue to work together to make the transformative change that people want to see uh, in our city without sacrificing uh, other city services, without sacrificing, sacrificing programs and investments, particularly those that will impact uh, our most vulnerable residents, uh, new Bostonians and uh, our communities of color, uh, along with obviously employees, uh, job security moving forward um, would, would be uh, in peril with the 112 budget. So uh, I am voting uh, yesterday because this budget, uh, despite not being perfect, does a lot of good citywide. And as an at-large counselor, I can point to things in this budget, uh, which uh, makes me excited uh, to be on this body, makes me excited to be casting this vote because good things will flow and we'll continue to work together as a body. We'll continue to work with this administration to tackle those bigger issues. And we also clearly have a post audit and oversight uh, opportunity as well. So with that, I'm a yes vote and I appreciate your time and attention and respect all of my colleagues, uh, no matter how they vote. Uh, it's a personal decision, it's a professional decision but as an at-large city council, there's so much good in this budget that I feel extremely comfortable uh, in supporting and voting yes on. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Councillor Flaherty. The chair recognizes Councillor O'Malley. Councillor O'Malley, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, and obviously I want to begin by thanking Chair Kenzie Bach and her team for a remarkably thorough and well-planned budget season amid an incredibly difficult backdrop uh, in the coronavirus and pandemic. Um, thank you to everyone on central staff, uh, particularly Michelle Goldberg, Kerry Jordan, Candace Morales, Shane Pack for working under these 
unprecedentedly challenging times. Thank you to my team um, for their great uh, work and support in serving the people of District 6. Um, this is my 10th budget on the council and none has generated such an incredible outpouring of engagement from my constituents. And I wanna thank everyone who reached out to me and my team. Um, I've learned so much from hundreds of conversations with people in my district and across our city over the past several weeks. I hear uh, those who believe the budget does not go as far as we need. And I also hear and will continue to work to convince my constituents who feel betrayed by my belief that the status quo needs to change and we must tackle systemic racism, even when it means having incredibly difficult conversations. It's my responsibility to listen to the anger and frustration of my constituents and find a real way forward through city policy, budgeting and otherwise. My conscience cannot ignore the voices calling for change, but my conscience also requires voting for a budget that advances that change, not leaving us with a flat one twelfth budget that represents the old status quo. And that is why I will be accepting the chair's recommendation to vote in favor of the operating budget. I want to be clear by what this vote means. A vote for this budget means we start July 1st with new investments funded in part by cuts to the police overtime budget. A vote against this budget means we return to the old budget without these changes. Right now, we too often ask police officers to solve our mental health, substance abuse, and homelessness challenges. But our police officers, and almost to a person would agree with this, that they're not necessarily equipped to be drug counselors, mental health clinicians, or social workers. That's why I was exceptionally proud to sign on and follow the lead of my colleagues earlier in this meeting in supporting an alternative response system that lets mental health workers, addiction counselors, and social workers respond to these problems and give people the help and the treatment that they need. But that's gonna take a little bit of time to plan, and it's gonna take even more time to implement, particularly as we are amidst pandemic. In the meantime, there are budgets in this, there are, excuse me, investments in this budget that reverse the trend that has made police responsible uh, and, and found us in this situation. When a shooting happens in my district, our neighborhood trauma team can't always be on the scene immediately because they are often in the hospital with the loved ones of the victims. Sometimes police are the only ones who can be left with families traumatized by violence. This budget, this budget in its revised state addresses that and changes that by increasing the size of the trauma team so that trauma-informed responders can take on this critical role. And I think that is something all of us agree with has to be an approach as we reimagine what public safety means. Moreover, the homelessness crisis in our city too often draws a police response that can't offer the services that homeless Bostonians need. In this budget supports $2.5 million of new funding for affordable housing vouchers to address the root cause of homelessness. It also addresses the root cause of youth opportunity with a significant, a significant increase in investment in youth jobs, including year round jobs, something that we as a body have clamored for since my first day in office a decade ago. Systemic racism is not only confined to public safety. We must also fight for climate justice, environmental equity, and so much more. As environment chair, I fought for this budget to include an expanded tree canopy funding mechanisms for neighborhoods that need it the most, citywide composting, and expansion of the zero waste program. This budget makes important investments, but I agree that we need much bigger change to reimagine public safety in our city, including a reallocation of our budget from punishment to public health. On average, across the country, 10 to 20% of calls to police departments are about mental health. Reallocating responsibility and funding for the public health functions currently in the police department is a goal we can achieve with the right planning. It will take time to make this transition, but it will mean police don't have to focus on mental health issues. And again, we've already begun this conversation an actual meaningful systemic change with the ordinance that was offered earlier today by several colleagues and signed on by most of us. Moreover, the budget here that we're about to vote on starts the change, but it's not necessarily as transformative for public safety. And that's because the right place to make these change is in the police union contracts that the council will soon have an opportunity to weigh in on. Until we win change in those contracts, further cut to police budget like uh, items like overtime would be worse than meaningless. 
Voting down this budget would dramatically increase the police overtime budget and erase the reallocation that we won so far. Every Bostonian who's angered by exorbitant salaries and lack of accountability should be paying attention to the upcoming contract. I commit to fighting for change, including transparency, police data, civilian review board, echoing the sentiments not only of the chair, Chair Bach, who's calling for the council to play a role. We can't negotiate and we shouldn't negotiate, but we can certainly convene all relevant stakeholders to figure out how we can actually make sure that a contract reimagines reforms and restructures and really allocates and addresses how we can fix and address systemic, overt, and institutional racism. Now, some of my colleagues will argue that we can reject this budget and wait for a new 2021 budget from the mayor. We can get to work. It may not be by the new start of the fiscal year, which is a week from now, but it may be in the month of July or August or September. We don't know that. We do not know that we can prevent layoffs if this budget were to fail. The only way we know that we can prevent layoffs, the only way that we know that we can be able to know exactly how much money, local aid money we're getting from the state is to vote for this budget today. The state's economic crisis means that local aid funding in our city will fall. The, the fact that we are amidst pandemic means that we could be jeopardizing every investment that's made in the trauma team, every investment that's made in affordable housing, every investment that's made in youth jobs and elsewhere. And it almost certainly means that there will be layoffs to city workers who are already struggling with the increased need brought on by the coronavirus. Voting against this budget will return us to the status quo just when we've started to leave it behind. I commit my voice, my vote, and my work to what I know will be a challenging but sustainable way to make impactful and meaningful change. And I just wanted to acknowledge uh, Councillor Edwards, uh, who I think demonstrated some incredible leadership in her remarks earlier. And what she had talked about, what Chair Bach had talked about, about using mechanisms to restructure zoning, using mechanisms for this body to have actually a line item veto proviso as it relates to the budget. This is what we can do. This is what we should be doing. So don't count me as an ally, count me as a co-conspirator. We can get this done. We absolutely should get this done. And I'm committed to working with all of my colleagues, all of my activists, all of my constituents, everybody to make sure. Finally, I will also be voting in favor of the education budget. I think that the investments, particularly to our students with special needs, is admirable. Lessening the number of students whom we have to facilitate with out-of-district placement is something that I've been calling on since my first day on this body. We'll continue to do so. This takes an important step in that way. Increased early education seats uh, and making sure that we can have more uh, more supports for our students during these very, very challenging times. I'll be voting for that. Similarly, with the capital budget, I am so grateful to have worked alongside so many residents on two key aspects as it relates to District 6, one being a new Eggleston Square branch library, as well as a firehouse in Eggleston Square, and a full renovation of Billings Field in West Roxbury. I'll be voting in support of all three major budget dockets. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, Councilor O'Malley. The chair recognizes Councilor Baker. Councilor Baker, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. I won't speak nearly as long as anybody that's gone before me, I promise you that. Um, I just wanna speak in favor of this budget here um, and, and almost kind of cut and paste what Councilor O'Malley had get a lot of good points there, but also to come back to Councillor Edwards, at the end of the day, this is city operations for us and for people to think that if on July 1st, we don't have a budget passed that we're gonna just, you know, pass one in a month or so, I don't, I don't see that happening. And, I, and we need to go into this next year, I believe, with financial surety. A, a past budget with, with quite a few good, um, you know, investments, investments in, in affordable housing and investments in the schools and investments in the, in the best, best, best clinicians. Um, I think the responsible thing to do here is to, is to pass this budget and to make sure that, that nobody knows what, what the effect will be. I consider myself a city worker first 
and have taken layoffs while I was in my city career. I'm actually coming up on my 10th anniversary of the printing department closing. It's not easy, especially for people when they, when they have families. If we have a vote here and we think that people can be let get laid off, we shouldn't be voting no on that. And I think, I think that even if we went one month, that puts us in jeopardy of layoffs and, and, and really harming um, what I think is the good care we take care of our cities, our, our, our parks, our libraries, our, our, our places like that. So um, I just want to thank the people that are voting voting today. And, and if it's a difficult decision for you, I thank you more. So thank you. Thank you so much, Councillor Baker. The chair recognizes Councillor Braden. Councillor Braden, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is a momentous moment uh, for me as a new councillor. Um, I want to thank all the central staff for their um, incredible work and support uh, in the budget process over this long, months long process that we have gone through. I want to also thank my uh, colleague and uh, congratulate uh, Councillor Bach for presiding over our, our, your first uh, budget with dozens of hearings, public comments, and working sessions. As a new councillor, I really appreciated your thoughtfulness and your guidance and your support in trying to understand the budget and the complexities of um, how, how the budget actually reflects how the city works. This was a very thoughtful and deliberative process in the context of a huge public health crisis and a global recession precipitated by the COVID-19 pandemic. COVID-19 has further intensified the huge racial inequities in our city in terms of our health status, housing insecurity, economic resources, food access, and access to technology. It, is, it represented huge challenges for our students in our schools, uh, enabled trying to keep up with their learning, and, and opens up the possibility of huge learning deficits as we go forward. This, this crisis has challenged us to do better and to step up and to work at making our city more equitable and more resilient. This is, not a time, this is a time of great pain and trauma in our city and in our nation with an unprecedented outpouring of support for the Black Lives Matter movement in the wake of the killing of yet another black man, George Floyd, by police in Minneapolis. Our nation and our city are crying out for deep systemic change. I also want to thank the thousands of people who have called and emailed our office advocating for uh, the reallocation of funds from the Boston Police Department. Through years of advocacy, not just in this moment, but for years um, of advocacy, council pressure and citizen engagement, we have made our way to this point. In a, in, in a, and see a, a city budget that is proposing huge investments in affordable housing. And um, that is, as for me as a housing advocate and where I'm coming from, it's a huge piece of the, of the issue. Uh, there is so much more that needs to be done. This one budget cannot make right the wrongs and address the deep systemic inequities in our systems. But I do feel that having listened to my colleagues today and, and listened to uh, uh, Councillor Edwards and Councillor Bach in particular, that rather than throwing it all to the wind and taking a chance that we can execute change in this moment, that this budget lays the foundation for lasting change for our city going forward if we are prepared to do the hard work that it will take to make that change happen. I want to assure my colleagues of color that I will work alongside you and support the policy roadmap that was laid out by uh, our Madam President last week in her letter to the mayor that I signed on to. There is so much work to be done and I am prepared to put my shoulder to the wheel and partner with you to address the systemic racism in our city. It is real, it is impacting the lives of so many people here and it needs to be resolved. And I am committed to working uh, for that sort of structural change that need, needed to make all that happen. Today, we have heard of the ongoing work uh, that many in our, our body is, are proposing. There's some really exciting proposals that will really get to the root of making change happen. 
it's not it's not a, a it's not a band aid. It is deep structural change and the way, and changes the way we do business in Boston. So with that said, I know I want to thank the thousands and thousands of um, advocates uh, who have written to our office, sent emails, called. I, I understand your, the level of frustration and anger and the need, your demands for action right now. I happen to believe and agree with the statements of Councillor Edwards that voting down this budget in this moment is not the way to go. I've also heard from, from residents of our district and, and, and employees who are fearful of the loss of their jobs. They have been working in the COVID crisis, helping with food security and, and trying to support our elders and, uh, and our students at home and uh, learning at home. There's so much pain in this moment, and I really feel that voting down this budget is not the way to go in this moment. I applaud the addition of summer jobs and youth program and the thousands, a thousand year round jobs. That is a really critical piece of helping to address uh, the issues that we're dealing with. I applaud the addition of 18% more money for housing, affordable housing. The, the money allocated to our schools budget is 80 million, an increase of 80 million. This happen, is happening at a time when other school districts are laying off hundreds of teachers. There is a, an addition of 40 million to public health, which we will need because we are in the middle of a pandemic. And the pandemic is not over by any stretch. And we need to have a robust public health structure to help us address those challenges. Food access, immigrant services. Many, many people are depending us, on us to make a good decision today. This decision, this one budget will not change the, the overall picture, but it is a first step in the right direction. I support reallocation of the 10% of the money in the police budget to help develop new options for public safety, some of which have been mentioned today. I especially want in the air, especially in the area of, of homelessness and mental health and domestic violence or domestic abuse. There is so much work to do. I'm excited and energized by the conversation. Uh, and I look forward to really working, uh, working to advance uh, this agenda with my colleagues on the city council to make Boston a more equitable, inclusive and resilient city. As we face not only the challenges of COVID and economic recession, which is, could be very deep and long, but also the challenges of climate change and all that that uh, means. And this, those, those challenges will impact our communities of color at a much greater rate. Uh, and we have to rise to the occasion and make sure that we address those head on and work together to make viable, long lasting solutions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councilor Braden. The chair recognizes Councilor Wu. Councilor Wu, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. The bread and butter that feeds structural racism are evasions and procrastinations. To pretend otherwise ignores the history of our country and our city and withholds the promise of Boston's prosperity and opportunity across all of our neighborhoods. This council has taken legislative steps and has voted time and again on non-binding resolutions that express our support for equity and justice. Yet passing this budget is a message to those calling for equity, justice, relief in our streets, those who have reached out to us by the tens of thousands, and especially those who aren't connected enough to reach out to their city councilors. It's a message that they should be satisfied with incremental change, and yes, crumbs. I refuse to be complicit in the inertia of delaying structural change as too expensive, too scary, not quite the right timing. My gut check often, as I'm thinking through policy and, and data and, and different perspectives, is what would I do if this was applying to my own kids. That fierceness that every mom and parent feels, guardian, caretaker feels when it comes to protecting their own 
would I be happy with the path set forward by this budget, with the change, the scale of change represented by this budget when it comes to the future for my kids? I say when we deny ourselves a chance to act, we pass on another share of that burden to the next generation, to all of our kids. So most of all, we must be honest with our constituents and ourselves. We will not solve all the city's challenges by June 30th. We won't end systemic racism this next fiscal year, but no one is asking us to. What we owe our constituents and our communities is to deliver the measure of justice, equity, and relief that meets this moment. Our role in the process as a city council is to fight for progress and hold the administration accountable to the standards that our residents deserve. When the administration chooses to run out the clock with impending fear of layoffs and cuts, our role first is to tell the truth. Just because some might think it unlikely or hard to come to a better agreement through moving to a provisional budget temporarily doesn't mean it's acceptable for us to hide that option under a veil of fear mongering with administration officials suggesting falsely to city workers that they will be laid off immediately starting July 1st. I, for one, am expecting no shortcut, but the roadmap that our residents deserve. And to be clear that residents and organizers in our communities have been offering up for decades and generations. At the end of the day, the budget is not just about numbers and relative percentages by tweaking numbers and seeing some sides go up in different places, but with no plans for how these changes will deliver impact, we are asking our residents, including city workers and their families, to once again wait for justice, equity, and relief. So I respectfully disagree that it's not worth pursuing more in this moment. Boston deserves a budget that matches our values and needs, and we deserve a budget process that values our advocacy. I'll be voting no today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councilor Wu. The chair recognizes Councilor Mejia. Councilor Mejia, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Um, I had a speech, but today is not the day for me to go there. I am going to be fully my true authentic self and making sure that I don't leave myself at the door. Um, I have been, you know, for those who may or may not know, I won by one vote. And that one vote I found at barbershops, at nail salons, by crashing barbecues and baby showers. It is the people and their voices that I'm carrying into this space. It is the people who put me in this seat that I am here to represent. And those people are my people. And those people are tired of dodging bullets. And those people are tired of waiting for change. I am no longer interested in having drip drop incremental changes that expect us to continue to hope and pray and wait some more about finally having the type of budget that really reflects the needs that our people find themselves into today. I am very disappointed about the process of which the politics of politics have gone down. And as a first term counselor, have learned a lot about how negotiations happen and how every day we negotiate against ourselves. I am very disappointed to hear that if I don't vote in a particular way, that my constituents and the city services that they are looking for will be put on hold based on how I vote. I'm very disappointed to hear that I, if I vote against the mayor's budget, will be sending a signal that I'm against the mayor. This is not the mayor's budget. This is the people's budget. Let's get that clear. These are our tax dollars that we're talking about right now. And the thousands of emails that I've gotten from people speak to what we're here to do, which is to stand firm in our convictions and fight for those who put us in office. And while I understand this 
notion that we were being irresponsible about not approving a budget. I feel like if our role as a city council is to ensure that the budget is our biggest responsibility, then it is our, our, it is our responsibility to make sure that we vote on our values. And that is what I'm doing. If this is the one moment in time that I have to flex my little political power in this type of environment that I happen to find myself in, if the budget is the only way for me to do that, then I'm going to stand firm in that conviction and vote in the way that I feel best represents the needs of this time. So with that said, I want to make it very clear that my vote here today is to ensure that the people who had never even been part of the process before, as much as we have seen today, actually have something to believe in. My hope is that the folks who have been left out of every single conversation recognize the power of their voice and recognize the power of their vote. There are many people out here who didn't even know what a F-121, F-112 budget looked like. There were lots of people who didn't know that it was their tax dollars that funds half of these things. Those are the people who I'm here to represent. Those are the people who I wanna make sure don't feel left out, unheard, unvalidated, or undervalued. Those are the people who I am voting on behalf of. Those who have gone for far too long unheard by this very institution that we call ourselves in now governing under. Those are the people who I'm fighting for today, right? And so if my vote and this little budget is all that I have to flex whatever little power I have, I'm going to do so because I know as one, as, the, as a person who won by one vote, how much every vote matters. But this vote is not just about the budget. It is about building a long-term strategy and making sure that we send a message and a signal that we're not here to do business as usual anymore, right? I didn't come here to play politics. I came here to change the way we play them. And this, this is the type of responsibility that we have is to ensure that we're listening to the people who put us in office. And now I'm gonna go to my little script because you know what? Um, this is what I do. And then I may go back to add a little, a little bit more because I'm gonna sink this moment in time because you know what? This is what people put me in office for is to speak my truth and here we go. So now I'm gonna move on to my written remarks, Madam President. I'm going to start off my speech by saying that the last few weeks of this budget process has been hard. But if I can be real, this job has been hard since before it began. We never fully, to, we never fully expected to be in the space we are today. We were elected by the margin of one vote and barely had enough time to assemble a staff before we even started this adventure. It hasn't been easy since then, but I wasn't elected to make easy decisions. As you all know, this is my first time working in the budget, and although I have nothing to compare it to, it felt especially challenging. We have dealt with COVID, we have moved our whole entire operation online, and more recently, heard directly from the people when it comes to how we fund BPD. During this whole budget process, our office has been thinking about what kind of public servants we want to be. We're not here to play politics with this budget. Too many lives are at risk. We want to give the administration the chance to come forward with a good faith effort. Because when we say that the budget is a value statement, this is our chance to make that happen. For our office, we couldn't possibly see this as a good faith effort until we see changes in how we fund the police department. If the goal of the police is to protect and serve, we need to start focusing on the service part. That means dismantling the gang database, reinvesting in mental health dollars away from the BPD and towards the Boston Public Health Commission, and establishing a public safety dashboard. But we also need to see more money for things like restorative justice in our schools and expanded low-income housing opportunities. During every hearing, I asked each department head what were they doing to make sure that information was available in multiple languages other than English. 
A lot of the departments said there was room for improvement to make this information more accessible. Some, some agencies were even surprised that I asked the question. At least in the beginning, by the end of the budget process, the departments already knew that they had to come ready to go. We need a budget that reflects the diversity of languages in our community and that is going to take, and that's, it's going to take more money than what is already being proposed. I would like to see all city departments be more intentional about how they engage and connect decisions to the voices of the people. I want to see a budget that builds the infrastructure for real transparency and accountability across all city agencies. And we can't have any of these conversations without investing in trauma-informed efforts that uplift mental health and social, social emotional impacts of poverty. I know these demands are a lot, and some they may even say it's too much. But we need to stop thinking about what it is easy and start looking at what the challenges are and rise to that occasion. We keep talking about how the budget is a quote unquote value statement. In our office, our values are informed by the voices of the people. And until we see that same sentiment applied to this budget, we cannot in good conscience vote in favor of it. And that is why today, of all days, I rise to use my voice and speak on behalf of the people who put me here and say that enough is enough. And if we're real serious about change, we have to change the way we do business. And that starts by making sure that we listen to the voices of those who put us in office. So with that, I end and yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councilor Mejia. And now that we have heard from all of my colleagues over the last two hours, <laughs> I will go ahead and I will try to keep my remarks brief, um, and then we will proceed with our voting. So I want to start by thanking Chairwoman Bach for her work throughout the entire budget process. I know this is her first budget as a counselor and certainly as the chair of Ways and Means, and you've shown tremendous leadership and I'm proud to be able to work with you as well as all of my colleagues on the council. I wanna thank the mayor and his entire administration, especially Chiefs Barrow, Smith, Cook, Osgood, and Dillon, and their teams for participating in this process and for their collaboration uh, throughout my two and a half years on this body. I wanna thank my colleagues. I wanna thank each of you for your commitment to a thorough and comprehensive review of the FY21 budget. I think we've had at least 28 hearings, a number of working sessions, including listening sessions that were dedicated to the public. I wanna extend my deepest gratitude uh, to the residents, to the advocacy groups, to the community organizations for their engagement in this process. Thank you for your thoughtful questions, for taking the process very seriously and for offering uh, thoughtful solutions to the many challenges that we face here in our city. I wanna thank central staff, uh, everyone on central staff, especially uh, Michelle, Shane, Cora, Candace, Carrie, Julie, um, the entire team for, for all of their work, for helping us navigate this budget process, especially during remote work. None of this has been easy. And of course, I have to thank my own team, and I especially want to shout out my chief of staff, Samuel Hurtado, and my policy director, Michaela Parkin. Never before in my life has there been an opportunity to create transformative change the way we can do so now. Change that begins to dismantle a system of structural racism and white supremacy on which so many of the policies in our city, our commonwealth, and country are built upon. This is only my third budget process as a counselor, as a District 7 city counselor, and my first one as president of this body. So I feel a tremendous responsibility, and nothing about this is easy. This moment before us will set the tone for generations to come. It will set the tone for how our city does business, how we address structural racism and address 
our discriminatory policies, how we invest in our communities and in our people. We have the opportunity before us to lift up those who historically have been left behind. For the last several weeks, I've been inspired by countless uh, advocacy and protests by residents and organizations in support of Black Lives. I'm incredibly honored to be able to do this work in partnership with all of you, with the advocates, with the residents, with the constituents in our community. To anyone who's watching, thank you for joining this movement, for applying pressure, for weighing in, for adding your voice to this process. We need you in this fight for true liberation for black and brown lives. Lots has, has been said about the budget, whether or not the budget's good, whether it goes far enough. I'll say this, in my two and a half years, it is the best budget that I've seen on the council. There are a number of important investments. You've heard many of them, ranging from education to immigrant advancement to housing to recovery. They're all important to me. As a district councilor, I fought hard for many of the investments that we see in this budget. I'm especially pleased to see substantial investment in housing, especially given our housing crisis, particularly in my district. I'm grateful for the 18 million of new housing, especially investment that will create ownership opportunities so more residents can own their own homes. There are important investments in education that will help teachers and students in the classroom. There are investments uh, in my district in terms of education, like at Madison Park. We've all been fighting for Madison, particularly uh, me and some of my sisters and service on the council. I'm very pleased to see the capital investments. Particularly in my district, there are a number of investments. We can look at the Dudley Library. We can look at uh, the complete streets. We can look at the investment in our parks. And it's, so it's really good to see this movement and this investment uh, on these projects. I'm excited to see um, everything that is happening around Nubian Square in terms of investment there. And there are other uh, areas where we are uh, funding supports for recovery and what is happening on Mass and Cass, even though that's not District 7, that is an important work. And so while there are several items that I'm really pleased about in this budget, I cannot stress enough that today's vote and what we do now does not happen in a vacuum. It's important that we keep all of the lessons that we've learned over the last few months, and quite frankly, over the last few years and decades, as we make this very important decision. We must recognize how difficult the last few months have been, particularly for, for us on the heels of our surge uh, with COVID-19. Knowing that these cases, as well as the deaths, have impacted the Black community in Boston disproportionately. COVID has exacerbated existing inequities, exposing for some what many of us already knew. The playing field is not level, and it never has been. We continuously see Black lives disrespected and devalued over and over and over again. So when the murder of George Floyd played out on national television, a callous and casual murder by a police officer who had his hand in pocket and his knee on neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds. We wonder what took everybody so long to see what we had been experiencing for centuries. The collective grief around George Floyd's murder or for Breonna Taylor who was murdered in her sleep in her own home, in her sleep in her own home, or Rashad Brooks creates an additional burden if you're black, particularly if you're in this work, because we know that at any moment that it could happen to one of us or someone that we love, a nephew, a cousin, a father, sister, niece. So here we are in this moment, this moment in our movement, and we have a real opportunity to do something different, to act boldly, unapologetically, promoting and protecting black lives. And that is what 
The black and brown agenda calls for, you've heard people mention the letter that I sent to the mayor highlighting a black and brown agenda. It, it is calling for the promotion and protection of black lives. And I, I just want to take a moment to thank my colleagues who have signed on to the letter. Um, I want to thank Councilor Arroyo and Councilor Bach and Councilor Braden, Councilor Campbell, Councilor Edwards, Councilor Mejia, Councilor Wu, Councilor Campbell, if I didn't say you earlier, for all signing on to that agenda. And I want to be crystal clear. We're not going to solve 400 years of oppression and structural racism, discrimination, anti-blackness in a five-page letter to the mayor or in a single vote on our budget. But this black and brown agenda is a place to begin. So the question before us is, what do we do now? Where do we go from here? Where do we stand in this moment in our nation's history? People have said, this is not about sides. And in many ways, that's right. This is not an us versus them or the community versus the police. It's not the council versus the mayor. It's not about those sides. But there is a side to take, and that's the side of justice. And that's where I want to stand today. Everyone on this body is in a position of power to change the conditions for the people in our city. And the question before us is, what are we going to do with that power? Are we going to continue to protect the system as it currently works, perpetuating the status quo? Are we going to act in this moment? Are we going to take bold action and set a different course? Now, our city's budget has the opportunity to repair some of the harms and create a just city. But we can't do it alone in the budget, as I've already said. We have a lot of legislative priorities that need to be advanced and need to move forward. And I'm grateful again for all of the investment uh, in this budget, but I worry that it doesn't go far enough. We need to do more to address systemic racism in our city. We need to do more to tackle anti-blackness when it happens. For all of you who would like to be co-conspirators, it's important to call this out. Too many of us let things slide. The see something, say something, that's what we need at this moment. But more important, we need do something. So the question is, what are we going to do? You've already heard many of the advocates, many people here who have uh, lifted up our uh, police budget, wanting to see uh, reallocation and investment in our young people and investment in our education, investment in jobs. And those are important investments that we need to make. You've heard people talk about the overtime budget. Important to highlight that since 2011, so less than 10 years, we've seen the overtime budget grow by 84%. 84%. We should all be concerned because it's not sustainable. Even if we had other investments for other areas, that is not sustainable. And are we any safer because we spend 84% more in overtime? I ask us this, are we any safer in our community? And if your answer is yes, let me ask you this question. Do black and brown residents feel safer? Do they feel safer because we've let the overtime budget grow by 84%. I can tell you that the black and brown residents in my district don't feel safer. They don't feel safer. So we have to ask ourselves, if we're really talking about public safety, we have to reimagine a way to do it differently. I'm really excited. I already spoke to the ordinance that came before us today, because it's that kind of work that we need to be doing to reimagine Boston, to reimagine law enforcement and public safety in our city so that we're not overburdening our police officers, asking them to be social workers. We've got a lot of work to do. And I want to see us make more investments in our community, in black and brown communities, so that they truly are safer and healthier and that they have the opportunity to build wealth 
and break generational poverty. For me, this budget is much more, it's bigger than just police or, or, or how we handle police and community policing. There are so many other aspects that we need to look to. And again, that's housing, that's education, that's supporting small business, that's supporting our workers, that's investing in our schools. Those of us who signed the letter, we are asking for more investment. We need to see different systems in place. In 2018, the city of Boston spent millions of dollars in city contracts and procurement, but only 1% went to local businesses, businesses owned by women or businesses owned by people of color. We have to ensure that there's equity in contracting, in development. There's so much work that still remains. We can't sit by and ask residents to continue to wait. We can't pass Band-Aid reforms when our system needs a complete overhaul. I know we've had lots of discussion in this meeting and in our hearings around the budget. And too often what I hear is yes, this is important, Black Lives Matter, but it might be too hard to do just now. Black Lives Matter, but we have to wait. Black Lives Matter, but we need another study. People are tired of waiting. And so while I know uh, people have indicated where they are on this budget, and there's lots of investment that I want to see, and I want to be clear, I support the investment in our schools and our capital budget, but I have deep concerns about our operating budget and the work that remains. Whatever happens today, however, I want to be crystal clear. Our work around structural change, transformative change, doesn't stop. Regardless of what happens with this budget, we have to keep working together as a council. We have to continue to work with the mayor and his team. And we have to continue to work with those that we serve in our community. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. So as a district councilor who is excited about many of the items in this budget that I fought for, that's in that budget because I fought for it, and many of you have fought for it as well, I'm still deeply, deeply, deeply concerned about the operating budget. And, you know, for those who are saying, this is our moment, this is our moment, I want to be crystal clear, and it's not just this budget vote, but this is our moment to do something different. Earlier in our meeting, we introduced, I introduced with my colleagues an ordinance to celebrate Juneteenth as an official holiday here. And that's important, and we need to continue to, to move that forward. People are tired of waiting. I've heard a lot of doom and gloom about what happens if the budget is rejected. And if we go into, like there's this either or, like either we pass the, the budget or there's this doom and gloom. And I know we've all been getting the calls about layoffs. Let's be clear, I don't wanna see anyone laid off. I wanna support all of our good city workers who are doing good work. And I wanna make sure that they have the resources that they need to do that work. But I also know that for the people that I represent in District 7, many of them, you know, the 112 budget, the full budget, for many of them, when they're facing displacement and all these other items or issues that are before them and they don't know how to navigate our system and get help from our Office of Fair Housing Stability and all of that, for them, you know, this feels like business as usual. For them, they feel like they have nothing else to lose. And in fact, we don't. We have nothing to lose but our chains. So now is the time for us to take bold action, not just with this vote on the budget, 
but with our full agenda, an agenda that promotes and protects black and brown lives. Eight of us, the city councilors, signed that letter. The invitation is still open for those who want to sign, for those who want to be co-conspirators. The invitation is open to get behind the agenda and to do the work. We need everyone in this fight. We need everyone in this fight. So with that being said, I think it's time that we move on and take our votes. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Moving back to our agenda. We've had more than two hours of discussion here. So I just want to bring us back and make sure we're, everyone's on the same page and on the same docket. If there's no other discussion, I'd like to move these dockets forward. The first docket is docket 0796. This is the docket for the operating budget. You've heard from our uh, committee chair, Chairwoman Bach, who seeks acceptance of her committee report and passage of that docket. And at this time, we're gonna take a vote on that docket. Okay. Everyone good for the vote? Yes. All right. So for docket 0796, Madam Clerk, I'm going to ask you to call the roll, please. Thank you, Madam President. Councilor Arroyo. To be clear, this is the operations? Yes. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. And I mentioned that. Yes. This is the operating button. No. Councilor Arroyo, no. Councilor Baker? Yes. Councilor Baker, yes. Councilor Bach? Yes. Councilor Bach, yes. Councilor Braden? Yes. Councilor Braden, yes. Councilor Campbell? No. Councilor Campbell, no. Councilor Edwards? Yes. Councilor yes. Edwards, yes. Councilor Asabi George? Yes. Councilor Asabi George, yes. Councilor Flaherty? Yes. Councilor Flaherty, yes. Councilor Flynn? Yes. Council Flynn, yes. Councilor Janey? No. Councilor Janey, no. Councilor Mejia? No. Councilor Mejia, no. Councilor O'Malley? Yes. Councilor O'Malley, yes. Councilor Wu? No. Councilor Wu, no. Madam President, docket number 0796, the operating budget, has passed with an eight to five vote. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Docket 0796 has been passed. We'll now move on to docket 0797. Madam Clerk, this, to be clear, this is the BPS budget, yes? Thank you. Yes, okay. Docket 07. Sorry. Yes, Madam Clerk. Think, yes. So yes, we're going to take a roll on this if we're good, and if if you could. So this is zero seven nine seven. Councilor yes. Arroyo. Just to be clear again, that this is education. Yes. yes. It's education. Oh, we could come up instead of him. Yes. So, Docket 0797, which is the education BPS budget. Councilor Arroyo. Yes. Councilor Arroyo, yes. Councilor Baker? Yes. Councilor Baker, yes. Councilor Bach? Yes. Councilor Bach, yes. Councilor Braden? Yes. Councilor Braden, yes. Councilor Campbell? No. Councilor Campbell, no. Councilor Edwards? Yes. Councilor Edwards, yes. Councilor Sabi George? Yes. Councilor Sabi George, yes. Councilor Flaherty? Yes. Council Flaherty, yes. Council Flynn? Yes. Council Flynn, yes. Councilor Janey? Yes. Councilor Janey, yes. Council Mejia? Um, yes. Council Mejia, yes. Councilor O'Malley? Yes. Councilor O'Malley, yes. And Councilor Wu? No. 
Councilor Wu, no. Madam President, docket number 0797, the BPS budget has passed with 10 votes in the affirmative and two votes in the negative. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Excuse me. Um, uh, uh, the Madam chair recognizes Councilor Bach. Councilor Bach. I just, just wanted to check the vote with the um, chairwoman. She said 10 to two, um, which it should be 13, I would think. I'm sorry. Thank you, Councilor. Oh my goodness. <laughs> 10 plus two. If only I could count. 11 votes in the affirmative. Thank you, Councilor. <laughs> it's been fair one of ways and means. 11 in the affirmative and two in the negative. Thank you. I'll Thank try you. to add better next one. <laughs> no, Thank you. Thank you for that. It's been a long, long meeting. So we'll chalk that up to long meetings. <laughs> Um, so that was 11 to 2. That was docket 0797, which is the education budget, and that has been passed. Right. Now we're going to move on to docket 0798. Right. This is the other post-employment benefits liability trust fund, otherwise known as OPEP. Okay? OPEP. Docket 0798 is OPEP. That is what we're voting on. Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll? Surely. Docket 0798, OPEP. Councilor Arroyo. Yes. Councilor Arroyo, yes. Councilor Baker. Yes. Councilor Baker, yes. Council Bach. Yes. Councilor Bach, yes. Councilor Braden. Yes. Councilor Braden, yes. Councilor Campbell. Yes. Councilor Campbell, yes. Councilor Edwards. Yes. Councilor Edwards, yes. Councilor Asabi George. Yes. Councilor Asabi George, yes. Councilor Flaherty. Yes. Councilor Flaherty, yes. Councilor Flynn. Yes. Councilor Flynn, yes. Councilor Janey. Yes. Councilor Janey, yes. Councilor Mejia. Councilor Mejia. What is it? I'm sorry. This is the OPEB docket number 0798, the other employment um, pension Fund. We're looking for your vote, Councillor. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Councillor Mejia, yes. Councillor O'Malley. Yes. Councillor O'Malley, yes. And Councillor Wu. Yes. Councillor Wu, yes. Madam President, docket number 0798 has received a unanimous vote of 13. Thank you. So docket 0798 has been passed. And now we will go on to dockets 0799 and dockets 0800. And these are the appropriations for the capital grant fund. Okay, so now this is capital. Everyone clear? Capital. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Could you please call the roll? Thank you. Oh, sorry, Madam, Madam President. Yes. So 0799 and 0800 are transfers into capital projects, but they, they come from the parking meter fund and the PNC fund. So just want to make that distinction. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman. Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll? Thank you so much. Docket 0799, Councilor Arroyo. I'm sorry to have to ask again, but just to be clear, which one is this? These are the... Um, Committees that the um, funds that were formed from the packing your packing clerk and I'm sorry, I'm looking at the wrong sheet. From the packing clerk uh, meter fund and from Commonwealth Transportation Infrastructure Enhancement Trust Fund. Yes. Councilor Arroyo, yes. Councilor Baker. Yes. Council Baker, yes. Council Bach. Yes. Council Bach, yes. Council Braden. Yes. Council Braden, yes. Council Campbell. Yes. Council Campbell, yes. Council Edwards. Yes. Council Edwards, yes. Council Sabi George. Yes. Council Sabi George, yes. Council Flaherty. Yes. Council Flaherty, yes. Council Flynn. Yes. Council Flynn, yes. Councilor Janey. Yes. Councilor Janey, yes. Councilor Mejia. Yes. Councilor Mejia, yes. Councilor O'Malley. Yes. Councilor O'Malley, yes. And Councilor Wu. Yes. Councilor Wu, yes. Madam President, docket number 0799 has received a unanimous vote. 
Thank you, Madam Clerk. Docket 0799 has been passed. We will now take a vote for Docket 0800. Docket 0800, Councilor Arroyo. Yes. Councilor Arroyo, yes. Councilor Baker. Yes. Councilor Baker, yes. Councilor Bach. Yes. Councilor Bach, yes. Councilor Braden. Yes. Councilor Braden, yes. Councilor Campbell. Yes. Councilor Campbell, yes. Councilor Edwards. Yes. Councilor Edwards, yes. Councilor Sabi George. Yes. Councilor Sabi George, yes. Councilor Flaherty. Yes. Councilor Flaherty, yes. Councilor Flynn. Yes. Councilor Flynn, yes. Councilor Janey. Yes. Councilor Janey, yes. Councilor Mejia. Yes. Councilor Mejia, yes. Councilor O'Malley. Yes. Councilor O'Malley, yes. And Councilor Wu. Yes. Councilor Wu. Yes. Madam President, docket 0800 has passed with a unanimous vote. Thank you so much, Madam Clerk. Docket 0800 has been passed. Now that uh, we finished with all of those, we have to now go on to the capital budget. Folks, remember, we took an earlier vote, that first vote weeks ago. We pulled earlier from the green sheets, and now we're going to take the second vote, right? Um, I would like to, at this time, recognize Chairwoman Bach. Chairman Bach, do you want to say a few words? Yes, absolutely. So I'll just say, I said this right at the beginning of the meeting, um, but that was uh, four and a half hours ago. Um, so <laughs> just uh, just remembering, pe reminding people that um, when, when we indebt the city, which is what we do with the um, capital budget, because we take, we take on bonds um, in order to pay for these projects, uh, there's two votes. And so as the president said, we took one back on the third. Um, and this is the second vote. It also needs to clear a two thirds threshold. Um, so uh, I'll just say that formally, I'm asking the council to take the second vote in the affirmative today on these loan order dockets. Um, and, uh, and there are four of them um, for different component pieces of the capital budget. Um, and again, again, technically these are a vote authorizing the city to take out the bonds in order to do this capital work. So thank you, Madam President. Thank you so much, Chairman Bach. Um, at this time, Madam Clerk, would you, so we're, just to be clear, we're on docket 0593, and if you could call the roll. Thank you. Thank um, you. Docket 0593, Councilor Arroyo. Yes. Councilor Arroyo, yes. Councilor Baker. Yes. Councilor Baker, yes. Councilor Bach. Yes. Councilor Bach, yes. Councilor Braden. Yes. Councilor Braden, yes. Councilor Campbell. Yes. Councilor Campbell, yes. Councilor Edwards. Yes. Councilor Edwards, yes. Councilor Sabi George. Yes. Councilor Sabi George, yes. Councilor Flaherty. Yes. Councilor Flaherty, yes. Councilor Flynn. Yes. Councilor Flynn, yes. Councilor Janey. Yes. Councilor Janey, yes. Councilor Mejia. C. Si. Yes. Si. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Councilor O'Malley. Yes. Councilor O'Malley, yes. And Councilor Wu. Yes. Councilor Wu, yes. Madam President, docket number 0593 has received a unanimous vote. Thank you so much. Docket 0593, after receiving its second and final reading, has been passed. Now we will, same thing, still yep. capital, we're going to take, <laughs> this is docket 0594. Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll? Thank you. Docket 0594. Clerk Royal. Sorry, I, I lost connection there when you were saying what this was. What was this? This is the second capital vote um, for docket number 0594. Thank you so much. Sorry, I had a blip on my connection. Yes. Perfect. Councilor Royal, yes. Councilor Baker. Yes. Councilor Baker, yes. Councilor Bach. Yes. Councilor Bach, yes. Councilor Braden. Yes. Councilor Braden, yes. Councilor Campbell. Yes. Councilor Campbell, yes. Councilor Edwards. Yes. Councilor Edwards, yes. Councilor Sabi George. Yes. Councilor Sabi George, yes. Councilor Flaherty. Yes. Councilor Flaherty, yes. Councilor Flynn. Yes. Councilor Flynn, yes. Councilor Janey. Yes. Councilor Janey, yes. Councilor Mejia. Yes. Councilor Mejia, yes. Councilor O'Malley. Yes. Councilor O'Malley, yes, and Councilor Wu. Yes. 
Councilor Wu, yes. Madam President, docket number 0594 has received a unanimous vote. Thank you. Docket 0594, after receiving its second and final reading, has been passed. Next is docket 0595. Madam Clerk. Thank you. Docket 0595, Councilor Arroyo. Sorry, I'm dealing with connection issues over here. Can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Can you just repeat what you just said? Docket number 0595. This is the third capital um, budget vote. Uh, it's already received its first vote on June 3rd, and we're coming for the second vote so we, it can be passed. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Council Arroyo, yes. Council Baker. Yes. Council Baker, yes. Council Bach. Yes. Council Bach, yes. Council Braden. Yes. Council Braden, yes. Council Campbell. Yes. Council Campbell, yes. Council Edwards. Yes. Council Edwards, yes. Council Asabi George. Yes. Council Asabi George, yes. Council Flaherty. Yes. Council Flaherty, yes. Council Flynn. Yes. Council Flynn, yes. Council Janey. Yes. Councilor Janey, yes. Councilor Mejia. Yes. Councilor Mejia, yes. Councilor O'Malley. Yes. Councilor O'Malley, yes. And Councilor Wu. Yes. Councilor Wu, yes. Madam President, docket number 0595 has received a unanimous vote. Thank you. Docket 0595, after receiving its second and final reading, has been passed. And last, and again, it's still capital. This is the second vote, right? right? right. Last is docket 0596. Madam Clerk, please. Thank you. Docket 0596, Councilor Arroyo. Yes. Councilor Arroyo, yes. Councilor Baker. Yes. Councilor Baker, yes. Councilor Bach. Yes. Councilor Bach, yes. Councilor Braden. Yes. Councilor Braden, yes. Councilor Campbell. Yes. Councilor Campbell, yes. Councilor Edwards. Yes. Councilor Edwards, yes. Councilor Sabi George. Yes. Councilor Sabi George, yes. Councilor Flaherty. Yes. Councilor Flaherty, yes. Councilor Flynn. Yes. Councilor Flynn, yes. Councilor Janey. Yes. Councilor Janey, yes. Councilor Mejia. Yes. Councilor Mejia, yes. Councilor Romali. Yes. Councilor O'Malley, yes. And Councilor Wu. Yes. Councilor Wu, yes. Madam President, the final capital vote for docket 0596 has received unanimous vote. Thank you so much. Docket 0596, after receiving its second and final reading, has been passed. Now we can move on to personnel orders. We're almost there. Thank you. Um, um, do I, yeah, docket 089. Thank you. Thank you. Docket 0829, Councilor Janey for Councilor Wu. Councilor Wu seeks suspension of the rules and passage of Docket 0829. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 The opposed nay. The ayes have it. Docket 0829 has passed. Madam Clerk, Docket 80, uh, 0830. Thank you. Docket 0830, Councilor Janey offers the following order for the appointment of the temporary employee. Oops, I'm sorry, I'm not supposed to read that much. <laughs> Thank you. The chair seeks suspension of the rules and passes the docket 0830. All those in favor say aye. 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 The ayes have it. Docket 8030 has been passed. Now we're moving on to late files. Don't see any late files. Madam Clark, any late files? No late files. I think there's a request for green sheets, maybe. Okay, let's then move on. Trying to get my gallery view back. Can I get my gallery view back? Somebody in central staff, please. Um, so we'll move on to green sheets. Anyone who wishes to remove an item from the green sheets may do so at this time. And I believe, I can't see him, but I believe Council Council Royal, Royal wants to. I can't see him because my gallery view is gone. Uh, but Council Royal, you have the floor. Yes, thank you. I do have, I'm trying to get the actual docket number, but it's the... It's uh, doc 0801, and it's on you. page 14 of 23 in the right. green. Thank you so much. I'm just going to throw through all my budget stuff here. Uh, it's in I, the order uh, allowing the use, uh, allowing the city of Boston... Me, to... Councilor, I'm so sorry. No if worries. you don't mind, I need, to, need it 
um, so that it is um, properly before the body, if you, if you don't mind. So no. before you do that, so Councillor Arroyo, you just want to kind of indicate where folks are, what the docket is, and where folks should look in the green sheets to find it. Right. Then the clerk will have to read it into the record, and councillors will have to have the opportunity to look at their email to get in the green sheets. Also, it's properly before the body. So now that you've indicated that it's docket 0801, and it can be found on page 14 of 23, Madam Clerk is going to read the docket, okay? Thank and you. During this time, your emails, you should have an email, okay? Madam Clerk, please. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. On page 14 of 23, in the Committee on Public Health, docket number 0801, sponsored by the Mayor, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept the use of various goods and personal property donated by various businesses and individuals for the use of the city to respond to the impacts of coronavirus coronavirus COVID-19 public health emergency. Goods accepted pursuant to this order may either be utilized by the city to support its ability to operate safely or distributed to residents and organizations within our community to support them as they face the consequences of this public health emergency consistent with the intent of the donors. This matter was referred to committee on June 17, 2020, um, and it is now properly before the body. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Clerk. And so at this time, I will call upon Councillor Arroyo. Councillor Arroyo, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, and thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, the, uh, I, I think she, sim uh, Madam Clerk summarized this pretty well, but it's an order that allows for uh, the city of Boston to accept and use donations of goods and personal property from various individuals, uh, private individuals and organizations and private businesses to support the city's response to the coronavirus, uh, specifically PPE. Uh, and so I would be seeking uh, suspension and passage today for this uh, to ensure that we can start doing that. Great. Thank you. So Councilor Royal seeks passage of docket 0801. All those in favor say aye. 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 Ayes have it. Docket 0801 has been passed. We're now moving on to announcements. I will recognize colleagues who indicate they want to say something by showing their blue hand, their blue Zoom hand. Okay. Um, the chair recognizes Councilor Sabi George. You have the floor. Uh, th thank you, Madam President. I would like to remind the council and colleagues that tomorrow at 4 p.m. I'll be hosting a town hall with BSAC, the Boston Student Advisory Council, to discuss the student member position on the Boston School Committee. I'd love you to spread the word and uh, share this information with your networks. It will be an opportunity to learn from our youth about why it's important that the student member of the Boston School Committee have full voting rights. Look forward to seeing you all tomorrow on that Zoom. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you so much, Councilor Sabi George. The chair recognizes Councilor Flaherty. Councilor Flaherty, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. I'm excited to announce a year 13 for Boston. It's a partnership with uh, Digital Ready at Wentworth uh, and the Bar Foundation that will provide a no cost accelerated pathway for underrepresented young people, students of color, first generation college students, uh, students from low income backgrounds, and uh, there's an opportunity for them to build uh, tangible pathways to economic mobility and success uh, in Boston's uh, innovation economy. So this year 13 is something that you guys know of discussed ad nauseum uh, is a bridge year designed for BPS graduates that will focus on the intersection of higher education and industry that will prepare students for the complexity of, uh, of, of that's constantly evolving around the economy, economy and society. So students will be provided resources, uh, a meal plan, uh, access to social and, 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 uh, and emotional uh, services, gym services, access to summer jobs and internships, as well as career coaching. They will, this is the best part, they will earn 18 academic credits, uh, making uh, college uh, more accessible and more affordable to them. So for those that are interested, and I'm urging my colleagues, uh, calling my colleagues out, give me at least one BPS kid in your district. Give me one BPS 12, uh, grade 12 student that wants this opportunity uh, the admission process started on June 22nd, and it is a rolling admission, and they can go to ready.org backslash year slash 13. And again, this is a tremendous opportunity 
for them. Uh, there'll be a pilot program of 40 students. Again, I'm calling out 12 of my colleagues to give me the name of one student, one BPS student in your district that this would be a perfect fit for. And let's partner together and let's get these kids on a path and a trajectory, get them into school. Uh, Wentworth is a, is a very well established, recognized uh, institution here. Uh, they're a big partner here, and this is an opportunity for them to technically possibly get into Wentworth or one of uh, the, the, some of the best colleges and universities that call Boston their home. So that's my announcement. I'm excited that we finally have a year 13, Madam President, and again, urging my colleagues. And hopefully when we, uh, Madam President, when we get back to the luncheon series, this will probably be a perfect uh, one to kick off uh, the luncheon series. So, and I'll sponsor. But thank you very much and uh, appreciate hearing from my colleagues. Give me one student from your district. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Flaherty, and I'm anxious to begin our lunch series. It's another opportunity for us to engage uh, with experts in the field and kind of move our work forward without burdening um, central staff around hearing. So anxious to get that started again. At this time, uh, the chair recognizes Councilor Edwards. I got you. Oh, I see you. Thank Councilor you. Edwards, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, uh, just congrats to everyone all around. And uh, you've been officially baptized to the newbies. Uh, I guess that makes me, Kim, and Eddie no longer freshmen, where I think we're, we can say we're sophomores now. Um, uh, some, some other notes. Uh, this, we started to do, I, my office started a tradition last year in Charlestown. I'm very proud of it, raising the pride flag. And we're gonna continue that tradition this Friday at 12.30. So we, we will be re uh, raising the pride flag, coming together as a community in Charlestown uh, to just celebrate, honestly, our, not only our diversity, but our commitment to um, social justice and assuring that Charlestown, along with all of our neighborhoods, are welcoming safe places for all of our community, lesbian, gay, transgendered, bisexual, all of our community. So I'm very excited about that. And then also, um, I wanna just shout out to the kids that turned it around, to the Charlestown Coalition and the Charlestown Resident Alliance. Uh, they reached out early on and said, we want to talk bla about black lives, we wanna talk about racism, and we wanna talk in our community of Charlestown about that. And I'm honored that they reached out to me to help convene that conversation with the police with folks who don't live in the housing development and they live in other parts of Charlestown who don't have their reality. These are uh, incredible kids, many of whom are black and brown, who want to lead a conversation, an intense, good, positive healing conversation in, in Charlestown, and I'm proud of them. So I'll, I will be there for them on this Friday. Thank you so much. Uh, the chair recognizes Councilor Mejia. Councilor Mejia, you have the floor. Yes, um, thank you, Madam President. Um, I just wanted to say really quick, that this entire journey has uh, been quite the roller coaster. Um, I didn't get to thank uh, Kenzie Bach, Councillor Bach, um, for doing all of her work um, and keeping us engaged and informed throughout this process. Really do appreciate her leadership in that space. Um, and to you, Madam President, um, for your relentless um, commitment to ensuring that black and brown bodies and lives um, are uplifted every step of the way. You and the work that you have done on behalf of this council um, and taking stands and speaking up, even when it was uncomfortable to do so, is the type of leadership that these times require. Um, and I have grown to um, learn a lot from you and from the rest of my colleagues here. I am rough around the edges and I am no longer making any um, excuses for how I show up and the fire that I speak and the truth that I bring will not be watered down, will not be censored and will not be silenced. And right after I made my speech, I got a call from a Dominican questioning who I am because I spoke with so much passion and he asked if I was black or if I was Latina. And let me tell you this, I am here to represent all people because all means all. And I am tired of living in a city that pushes people to pick. So I am a black Latina and I am proud of it. And if anyone has any problems with the way I show up, 
and how loud I go and how hard I go for black lives, then they just better take a seat at the table because I am not here for any of it. So to that Dominican that calls me, I am a black Latina and you are black too, so deal with it. Thank you so much, Councilor Mejia. The chair recognizes Councilor Bach. Councilor Bach, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I'll be very brief. I just, uh, I would be remiss not to myself directly thank central staff for this budget process. Um, a number of other counselors have done so, but I just really wanna thank Carrie and Candice and Michelle and Thane and Cora and the whole team. And then thank my staff, John Spillane, who's our budget director and who also ran a whole bunch of staff clinics for other staff. Um, Lauren Brody, my chief of staff, Emily, uh, Emily Brown, my uh, policy director, and Henry Santana, my director of operations. I just, I, I neglected to mention them, and the budget takes over the entire life of everyone in our office. And I just can't let the meeting close out without, um, without thanking them for all their work. So thank you. Thank you so much. Seeing no other announcements, um, I, I just kind of want to lift up Black fathers. Um, Father's Day was Sunday, and it was my first Father's Day without my own father. As you know, my father passed away suddenly, unexpectedly in February, Black History Month. And so it was very bittersweet for me, but I took a lot of comfort um, when I wasn't being interrupted by all the calls around the budget. I took a lot of comfort in really celebrating fathers in general, but especially Black fathers. And I, I make the point of lifting up Black fathers because um, the narrative that is out there is that black fathers are absent, that black fathers don't care, that they are not raising their children, that they are not supporting their families, that they're not actively engaged in their communities. And that is false. So I wanted to, one, say happy Father's Day to all the dads, but particularly lift up black fathers. Um, and part of what I said earlier was about rejecting, you know, that false narrative of that false choice. And I really appreciate uh, the words of my sister in service, uh, Council Mejia, for, for challenging those who question how you can be Latina and Black because you can. And, and, and it's the same around the budget, rejecting the notion that either you support Black lives or you have to be for the immigrant community that's going to be impacted. It's both. And so thank you for putting that out there, Council Mejia, about rejecting that and also speaking truth to power. Because shame on anyone who tells people how they're supposed to show up to express their pain or their experience. So thank you for that. It's been a long meeting, so no more speeches. I'm not going to give another speech. Um, I, I just wanted to lift up Black fathers and say thank you for, for speaking your truth to power and for rejecting false choices. Um, so anyway, we can now move on if there are no other announcements. We will adjourn our meeting the way we always do in memory of those that we've lost, okay? And for Councilor Braden, it's John Bernard Cusack. And for the entire city council, Rashad Brooks of Atlanta. A moment of silence, please. Thank you. The chair moves that when the council adjourns today, it does so in the memory of the aforementioned individuals, and we are scheduled to meet again on Wednesday, July 8th. That's a week from today. Uh, Wednesday, July 8th at 12 noon. For the safety of the general public and all those involved, the meeting will be held virtually and posted online. Viewers can watch the council meeting live on YouTube by visiting boston.gov slash city Council-TV. All those in favor of adjournment, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Leopold, aye. Aye. the ayes have it, and the council meeting is adjourned. Congratulations. Only five hours. <laughs> but you did it. <laughs> Only five hours. <laughs>